Hello, welcome to CPH Conference Day 5, Documenting the Future. I'm Lauren Boyle, and I'm a member of the New York-based collective DIS. For those of you that don't know DIS, in 2018, we transitioned from a magazine to a streaming platform, producing and commissioning original series, talk shows, cartoons, and documentaries that take on our current obsessions, like the future of money and inequality, the nature of belonging in a rootless networked world, and how the liberal and the democratic are pulling apart, and the future of work, just to name a few. The session today, documenting the future, is at least a little eerie. It feels a little bit odd right now as the world seems to be falling apart before our very eyes. So how can a documentary practice not only capture what has happened, but what could happen? We're gonna visit with a group of artists, filmmakers, and thinkers that find truth through fiction or the fictional in everyday truths. They use the language and tools of nonfiction filmmaking, storytelling, sociological research, startups, and other common modalities to reconfigure failed narratives and build alternative futures. Our first conversation is with artist Simon Dubrow Muller. And the project that we're gonna be focusing on was actually originally commissioned for the exhibition that DIS curated at the Kunsthalle Charlottenburg in partnership with CPH Docs, unfortunately. It has been postponed until spring. Um, we don't have a date yet for that. The title of the show though was, What Do People Do All Day? And it was taken directly from Simon's new episodic series. Simon, welcome. Um, can you. you tell us a little bit about the project before we screen the first episode for our audience? Sure. Um, the project in turn takes, you You took the title from this piece, but, uh, but my project took its title from a, a children's book uh, by Richard Scarry in the late 60s called What Do People Do All Day? Same name. <clears throat> and uh, the original children's book is, uh, is a book about, a uh, book showing anthropomorphized animals doing people's stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, having all the different vocations that kind of uh, constitute a uh, little society, mm -hmm. a town. Um, and uh, yes, I kind of like, I guess, made like a, a, a both an adult version of this and also uh, an updated version in terms of adding different other vocations that would not have been there at that time. Uh, so, so added kind of um, uh, app-based kind of gig economy vocations and, and to mix them with these old kind of like anachronistic, almost anachronistic seeming vocations mm -hmm. that are not that anachronistic, but I guess we'll talk about that later. Great, thank you. Should I turn it on? Yeah, let's do it. Do you know who fixes the clocks? Do you know who makes sure the train won't crash? Do you put money in the bank for safekeeping? Do you know who made your shoes? Have you been to a hospital? <sighs> What's the first thing you do in the morning? Do you get up and stretch? Do you look outside to see what the weather is like so that you know what to wear? Maybe there are clothes you have to wear. Do you have a job? Do your friends have jobs? Do you know any plumbers? Any real estate agents? Disillusioned teenagers? Do you understand futures trading? Do you know where the apples in your apple pie come from? What do you do? Can you make a living?
Once everyone was a worker. Some workers worked indoors and some worked outdoors. Some worked up in the sky and some worked underground. Some workers always did their work at the same place. Others travelled from place to place to do their jobs. The farmers stayed on their land. They grew all kinds of food. They kept some of it for their families. The rest was sold to the grocers in exchange for money. The grocers sold the food onto the other people in town. With the money they earned, the farmers bought food to eat and clothes to wear. Then, they put some of the money in the bank. Later, they would use the money in the bank to buy other things, a ball, or a chair, or a camera. The first photograph ever made was of a window and its view. The first film ever shown was of workers leaving the factory. Perhaps you know someone who works in a cafe, or a bar, or an MFA student, or a priest. Maybe you work as a content producer or a solution associate. You might know a poet, or a coder, maybe an occupational therapist, or a punk. I wonder what they look like. Either way, it's eight o'clock in the morning. When you come out, it will be dark. The sun won't shine for you today. Wow. Um, Simon, thank you. So for me, this video really speaks to how the industrialized world is increasingly experienced through technology and alienation, alienated from one another, but also 
by the complex systems, uh, networks of information, and the data sets that we rely on for really everything, including our most most basic needs, food, and, and actually maybe even sex in some cases. Um, and yet, yeah, so half of the video is actually these like two young lovers. Uh, so what's the connection between this primal need for physical touch and the progress narrative of technology? Sorry, I'd forgotten to put on my audio. Here we go. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that um, um, as you're saying, I mean, like at this point, there's there's very little difference between whatever DHL and Uber and then Tinder and Grinder. You know? I mean, like it's all like yeah. seems like a little same thing. And uh, I feel like I grew up with, as a child of the boomers, I grew up with a with a narrative where uh, there would always be an out somehow, like an outside of the system, and that outside would somehow be represented by um, being naked with another or multiple other people. Uh, uh, so that kind of like uh, directness, the, the whole narrative of of, uh, of uh, the realness somehow being anchored in the body, mm -hmm. uh, and and I feel like that it has in so many ways been co-opted at this point. So so that so that when you watch this series, I think that you'll sit with a kind of like a, a kind of split relationship to to the to the people making out, uh, both hopefully being carried away with the with with the with the warmth and the beauty of it. But also, kind of like, sit with the knowledge of uh, of uh, these things. Um, you know, like that 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 everything that is uh, connected with desire and lust is is ultimately transactional at this point. No, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you like that the fact that our desires, our lust, is being mined by digital technology at every yeah. every given time at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm. I think we're the same age, so I'm also like I've definitely. I didn't get to experience the uh, Tinder dating um, or any of any of that, um, and and I find it to be like a bit uh, um, like disconcerting, you know, like like seeing how seeing how people sometimes like like kind of rely on algorithms to find matches and things like this. So um, for, it was it was really powerful for me. The other part um, that struck me as being really interesting about um, the script, particularly, is that you use the the past tense throughout. So it's like once upon a time we were all workers, and I think it's a really effective way of kind of producing this sense of nostalgia, but also anxiety and angst for the present that we're living in. Uh, and I kind of read it as a sort of like time capsule or a message from a distant post-capitalist future um, or for or from, I'm not sure. Um, and I just kind of, I, I wanted to know um, how you imagine it when you were writing the script. Was it an artifact? Is it a message for future generations to your daughter? Is it personal in some respects? Um, how did you come up with that language? I mean, like the so the language is is borrowing quite heavily, both from from uh, from Richard Scarry's original books and also from, for, but in a free way, but but still, uh, but also from uh, this uh, Italian <clears throat> or this film called uh, The Working Class Goes to Heaven. Mm -hmm. This guy Petri, um, a film from the seventies. But but it's true that then I kind of like added this kind of past tense. The the once we we were all workers. Uh, every episode kind of like starts with that, and and everything is in past tense. And of course, it's like first and foremost, it's like a formal device that creates a certain kind of distance. And whether it's speaking from a moment in like two years or uh, centuries from now is kind of like this uh, is dubious, no. But it kind of like does a similar thing to to kind of like the way that fairy tales kind of um speak of a, of a different time so it's like this fantastical other this other no yeah and so it's a, so it's a formal device of kind of like creating a distance and i think that that um the kind of creating a distance is what also happens in the scary books but also in a lot of the, uh, the people i've looked at in in whatever in, in literature if you look at kind of like balzac and and like the the human comedy uh all these kind of like people look at um at the the world kind of like in a in an aerial perspective yeah. from far away as a kind of ant heap. Um, 
Yeah, yeah it kind true. of has this like uh, statistical nature to it, you know, like it's it's this architect or this engineer, this kind of like uh, otherworldly ominous voice speaking. And you can, you know, I mean, you get a sense that it is kind of a stand in for these very complex structures that um, make up our everyday lives, you know, and us is just, yeah, they, they're little ants. Hmm. Um, well, my next question is, is uh, is also related uh, to that, actually. Um, you know, when, when I talked about like these, like finding fiction and everyday truths um, in the introduction, what I was really kind of referring to this is this idea that like, you know, banks, borders, religions, nations, laws, traditions, corporations, these are all fictions, you know, that we tell each other, they're subjective, you know. Um, these are institutions that really are holding together the police officers, the realtors, the data analysts, the butchers, the freelancers, the, the material, the people, you know? And, um, you know, if the COVID-19 epidemic has really taught us anything, it's that the non-essential workers are really the bankers and hedge fund managers and the oil executives, while the essential workers are the grocery store clerks, the warehouse workers, the delivery truck drivers, the medical professionals. Um, and I don't know, I mean, obviously you made this this film, you know, several months ago. Um, I mean, you just finished it, but uh, you couldn't have known how much um, the series would really resonate with today's work from home and social distancing measures. Uh, and I'm kind of curious, like, how has your, how has your view of the project perhaps shifted um, in light of the epidemic? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how much. I mean, I don't. I don't want to uh, overplay the the role of this piece in in relationship to to the epidemic. But of course, it's the epidemic kind of has changed everything. It's scary yeah. times. Um, but um, I think that one of the things that the epidemic has does, uh, done done uh, is that it's kind of exposed the construction of of, uh, of the system that we live in, both the kind of connectedness and the disconnect disconnectedness of, yeah. of our world and the economical system that the globalized world we live in. Um, and, and, I, and, and of course, that does something to our eyes when we then look at stuff like this. Now, for me, for example, some of the metaphors that I use have become like quite... Have <laughs> uh, for example, uh, there's throughout all three episodes that we've made so far, there's, there's this constant wind and this wind, of course, is somehow like if we if we go back to Richard Scarry, which is all about like being a part of the machine and the machine is relentless, kind of like working, working for all of us. And what we experience right now, of course, is the machine put to a stop somehow. No, and then we hear mm -hmm. this thing outside, and that's the wind somehow. No, we hear yeah. the wind, we hear the silence. Um, and this this wind, of course, is somehow like an outside also. So it, so it kind of reminds us that there is an outside to the system that we live in, no? And this is something that I've been interested in uh, for a long time, and and that this project is very much about, like kind of like reminding ourselves of that uh, that we live in this this very constructed situation. There's an outside to both to a lot of things. Yeah. Um, sure. Which I think is maybe what your question. Yeah. Uh, I think we forgot to show slides, or maybe we, we did. did. We did. <laughs> do you want to do you want to share anything before I move on to perhaps my last question? Um, we can uh, we can see if there's some some of this is relevant. Who are the actors that you're working with? Um, they were uh, we had we had to do kind of like uh, casting calls because because. Uh, Doing nudity is is uh, is a little bit more complicated than just asking your friends. Yeah. Um, so they were very they came from very very different places. Some were professional actors, some worked in in adult entertainment, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, yeah, very different backgrounds. Uh, they were all great, uh, and it was really amazing to do and to shoot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, this, this second episode. This is from the second episode, uh, which is called Building a New Road. Mm -hmm. And this one is from the third episode, which is simply called Water. Um, yeah, I mean, like, and then, uh, no, ask the next question. Now, can you maybe okay. use the slides? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, there's, this is great. Yeah. So there's really so much pow power, you know, there's an enormous power in storytelling. Um, and um, when we read stories to our kids and what we hear on the radio, you know, just about everything seems to reinforce the same systems and ideas that teach us that if, you know, you aren't a boss, it's because you aren't smart enough, you're not working hard enough. Um, it's not just because your parents were bosses, you know? Uh, can you talk a little bit about like your inspirations and your references for the series? Uh, sure. Um, I guess, I mean, like that uh, multitude of, uh, of uh, inspirations. Now we're just at a slide of uh, this uh, August Sanders cook. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I have another image. Uh, where is that? Right here. That's Irving Penn's plumber. Um, which are two kind of like uh, vocations that I've worked quite a lot with in the, in the past. Uh, and, and of course, like these two images, for example, is uh, images that have followed me for quite a long time. Like you have like Agosenda, someone who's compartmentalizing uh, uh, human labor and vocations and, and, and the roles that we play in society. And then you have Irving Penn doing that uh, quite a few years later uh, in the States instead of in, the, in Germany and in front of a totally different backdrop somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and that these things have been inspirations for me. Then um, the the whole thing kind of like started with me reading uh, Richard Scarry to my kid uh, these books to my kid, and then realizing that there was like this incredible sadness with reading them because they obviously uh, are unre definitely unrelated to our times now. Like that, none of the things that he describes as something positive are positive now. Um, we do not have a positive kind of like connection to uh, work. Uh, work has become something that that um, that uh, um, places a secondary role to all kinds of, uh, all, to different other kinds of, mm -hmm. of ways of, of accumulating wealth. Uh, so both that, but also uh, that we don't have the same kind of belief in society. We don't have the local has disappeared. No, like etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So these things, and it made me think quite a lot about like uh, like an almost like a McLuhan esque kind of mm -hmm. uh, use the village as a symbol for, for larger things. Mm -hmm. um, in the video also, I, I um, use, let's maybe look at some of Richard Scarry's things while we talk about it. Yeah, here. This is, the, this is the exact episode that we're talking about. Um, in the video also, there are quite direct or literal references to the Marxist term dead labor. Uh, you have like these skeletons that are that are dressed in working uniforms. Oh, uh, wow! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you have, uh, and then you have like these these quotes from from this uh, film I spoke about earlier: "The working class goes to heaven." Um, yeah. So there's like there's like a bunch of different uh, references, I guess. And another thing we didn't speak about so much is like kind of the difference between the the world that that uh, Richard Scarry builds up here in Busy Town. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the kind of television that I grew up with in Scandinavia in the eighties. Right. Um, yes. I mean, when I look at the Richard Scarry books, and I've also read them to the kids, you know, there's this great like equalizer. You know, there's no like top or bottom to society. You know, everyone's interconnected and doing their their small bit to kind of help the whole thing. You know, uh, like like move along and work and. And it just, it, it feels very disconnected. So I de definitely identify with the the sadness in, in um, reading those stories in a way today, uh, especially in, a, in the United States, which is, you know, has a particularly um, um, cruel form of, of capitalism. <laughs> so the, the, other, um, the other reference, which we talked a lot about before you began um, working on it was uh, the Thomas Winding and um, Paul Norsgaard show from the 70s, which I'm going to ruin the name. So could you tell us what it was, how to, what it was called? To say the name of, of, the, yeah. of the, the show is yeah. called Omnantliu, <laughs> which means kind of like uh, opposite, opposite yeah. town. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> those two figures uh, were, were they were really important for for, for Danish uh, kind of moving image in general at that point. I would mm -hmm. say there was this weird. I'm not exactly sure why this was, but there was a weird pocket for some maybe even like 20 years where mm -hmm. 
uh, Danish children's television was was incredibly good and very very experimental, and of course this is produced into a totally different situation no? because like they made uh, they kind of had a pocket within state funded uh, television, and what they did was basically that they constantly kind of like tested the limits of what you could do within this state funded uh, uh, scenario. This this particular uh, show uh, opposite town or immensely, uh, what they did was very very simple. They they uh, got hold of, of quite dull kind of documentary footage of a normal Danish village, um, and they turned it upside down and uh, played it backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they claimed that it was like an experimental city produced by the Danish state, and they kind <laughs> of like spoke about like how everything worked within this village. No, was that every um, episode that like that that happened, or was it the whole jux of it? Like was that again? Sorry. Was, was it the whole thrust of the the show was about like be, like this that premise? Or did they I mean, like so. This was a sec. It was a segment within another within Got a it. larger show. They right. had like a one hour show that was back when television was slow. So it was mm -hmm. like a one hour show, and then they had this little segment every time about this city. So like mm -hmm. like kind of like when the news kind of mm -hmm. we're now going to speak with our reporter in the field kind of thing. So what was different in that town that you remember other than it being upside down? No, I mean, like they kind of like they analyzed everything, kind of like uh, okay. every. I remember one thing where you have like a, a car, and instead of like exhaling fumes, it was suck it in. So yeah. it was kind of cleaning. It was driving through the city and cleaning the air. Yeah, like clean. Oh, yeah. very cool. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Anything. Yeah. I um. Yeah, I think that like you know we like dis has kind of you know attempted to kind of bring back this kind of um this like uh this kind of like critical but also very like radical and free space for for content you know um and when we found out about this it reminded us a whole lot about um another show that was really big in spain in in the 80s called la bola de cristal which um we're we're trying to subtitle right now and put on this uh so everyone can see it, but it, but there's a lot of similitudes between the two of these um, shows. And I, I just want to mention before we wrap this up that um, Simon's video will be um, on DIS. Um, hopefully next week uh, you'll be able to watch that video on DIS and um, subsequent episodes uh, two and three. What are the titles of the second and the third episode for us? Uh, building a new road is episode two, and mm -hmm. episode three is water. Water, great. Uh, and currently, if you are um, in Denmark, um, Dis.art, the full um, archive and library is um, open to the public, and anyone can watch anything there. Otherwise, you know, pretty much everything on the landing page um, is is available to watch. Um, and yeah, please like join us and um, come back to see episodes two and three uh, very soon on this. And thank you, Simon. Um, thank you, Lauren. And hopefully, hopefully we'll have a show uh, with a really great installation um, by Simon in, what do we think, May now, April? <laughs> Uh, in Denmark. Denmark is doing a great job with um, the coronavirus, it seems. So hopefully, hopefully sooner than later, we'll be back. Totally. Hope so. I don't think we're doing questions from the audience, are we? Do we have anything in our chat? Doesn't seem like it. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, thanks, right. Simon. Thank you so much, Bye. Yeah. yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.
Hi, hi, thank you um, for, for staying with us. Um, our next session is economic science fictions. Um, for many of us, computer technology seems almost inseparable from the corporate hypercapitalism of Silicon Valley or from the Department of Defense funding, which spurred so much of high tech development, not least of all, the internet. But in the Soviet Union uh, of the 1960s, some technologists saw computers as machines of communism and cybernetics as the answer. In the sci-fi essay film, After Scarcity, artist, filmmaker, and writer, Bahar Nouri Zada explores the historical past in search of our possible future. Uh, Bahar is joining us today uh, from London. So Bahar, welcome. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, for the second time. Um, I guess it's good to have an audience these days for the sake of performance. Um, so I'm, uh, as uh, Lauren uh, just explained, I'm gonna briefly talk about a research project that finished uh, as a film in 2018 um, called After Scarcity. And um, it's a historical anecdote that's basically describes how the very quotidian technologies at our disposal today, um, personal computers, the internet, mobile phones, could be revolutionary tools for the purpose of a different economy. Um, and I wish there was uh, more time to use this moment and reflect on what the current shock to our usage of these technologies. Um, like the very fact that CPH Docs is running its conference online for the first time and the expertise and the knowledge that's produced in the meantime, like what would this potentially could mean or indicate as we move forward at this point uh, beyond the COVID crisis. But um, I guess we can leave this for a later time and or I'm sure it's gonna come up in the other panels today too. Um, and uh, so to go back to the talk, the title of the talk is borrowed from a book of the same name called Economic Science Fictions by the political economist Will Davis. Um, Davis, uh, he alongside a number of radical economists um, and thinkers uh, have been calling for basically an impeachment of the science of economics, uh, especially since um, it's great failure to predict or adequately respond to the financial crash in 2008. And, um, but like since the 80s, uh, we know from uh, history of economics that with basically each large scale crisis, um, there has been a number of economic theories who diagnose the death of uh, the neoliberal market economy. Um, but as Philip Mirovsky writes, um, despite all these declarations of death of neoliberalism, um, not only ne neoliberalism doesn't die, uh, it's further augmented and further empowered uh, throughout these years uh, without a single of these economic ideas being expired, actually. Um, so this is the condition and we're at the point that um, according to many people, we, we're desperately in need of a radical imagination that can get ahead of this capital imaginary. Um, and its speedy mutations and re-regulatory mechanisms. And this is where I see actually an opening for art and artistic practices to approach these topics. Um, because for one, art and finance, uh, finance both operate uh, speculatively and with the mode of speculation, which is also um, why, for example, we see in the past few decades um, that art has become such a perfect culprit um, and sidekick for investment and real estate projects, um, which is basically capital capitalizing um, on arts boundary breaking, future forward qualities um, to further dilute and release itself into life and living practices. Um, so to go back to the talk, one um, radically imaginative, imaginative story that um, started to circulate actually in the aftermath of 2008, uh, was a was a story uh, that was published in a book called Red Plenty by Francis Spofford, who's this writer based in London, uh, and it's a fictionalized account um, of the this overlooked uh, cybernetic developments in the USSR um, around um, which really it started from the communist revolution, like until the end of the Soviet Union. 
um, and how, um, as it very quickly became apparent, uh, the Soviet centralized command economy uh, owned by the workers, it realized that it has no option to succeed against um, its capitalist counterpart um, other than taking advantage of computers that emerged during the Stalinist 50s. Um, and more specifically, these scientists anticipated the coming of the internet, but not in the way that we engage with them today, uh, primarily for atomizing advertisement in the service of the market, but really to um, think about large scale socialist planning. Um, but like to like give a, a larger context, 20th century economics, both communists and capitalists, um, they both viewed economy as a computational problem. And this is really exemplified in the debates around the socialist calculation problem that um, early market ideologues posed against the centralizing schemes of these Soviet planners. Um, namely, uh, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, um, who are figureheads and famous uh, figures of the Austrian School of Economics. Um, they mentioned that any attempt at a centralized social planning uh, was bound to lose the game of efficiency to the supercalculator of the market. So the problem was the sheer amount of data that had to be collected and stored and processed and analyzed and circulated at every instance by the centralized system to retain the national economy at its optimum performance. Um, but like in contrast, Hayek and von Mises, they mentioned that they elevated price to be the most accurate means of telling change and emergence in a dynamic system. And basically pricing, through pricing, the capitalist economy could bypass those unnecessary calculations. Um, so the market really for them was a computer and the price was not only like one of its properties, but the measure of change itself in, a, in the society at large, not just like change in the market, but change in the society. Um, so the market would be kind, some kind of ledger that holds like humanity's history together, humanity's history and archive, like um, not really metaphorically. Um, which is where the past is inscribed and stored and the future is dictated for these people. But like, as we know, and as even like was kind of like apparent to the Soviet cyberneticians in the 60s, like computer, computers would completely change this um, dilemma. And um, looking at it from the perspective of 2020, um, big data analysis, big, da big data storage, the supercomputers used in uh, meteorological facilities, climate modeling, like material testing, astronomical calculations, like they have the capacity and actually a billion fold increase in computational speed compared to that time to actually pull off this uh, these calculations. So the technical, the technical kind of limitations uh, are long gone and now we are dealing with um, everything else that was at the place back then too. Um, but what I want to kind of like, um, the second part of what I want to, want to really remap uh, Soviet cybernetics to 2020, uh, which is a big uh, kind of like, you know, it's a question that keeps coming up with um, um, wherever I show the film, uh, which I don't really prescribe like, you know, that model for now as it was. Uh, we know that we need to make many adjustments to it. Um, um, so as Frederick Jameson says, uh, with any utopian thinking, um, all we know really is the limits of our own experience or um, the way he puts it is um, utopia is not a representation but uh, um, an operation that calculates the limits of our own imagination. So all we know is how our limitation is. Uh, bounded because like all utopian thinking and imagination is still based on past experience. Um, and Jameson says that's why um, it, it's not, it's in what science fiction cannot show, like speaking of science fiction, and in that negative space of uh, the restriction of imagination that we see the potential for the present moment to change and the susceptibility of the present uh, to change. Um, 
And so that basically doesn't concern the future of the present. It's not so much about like, you know, this like um, free wild future, but like the, the future of some past that we see as the present. And this future of some past, that was the case of Soviet cybernetics, uh, I want to say is more or less modeled in the Chinese centralized economy. Um, and we know with all these strengths, it's far from ideal for um, any non-authoritarian, truly inclusive planetary socialism that we need so much today. Um, more importantly, um, all of this conversation we're having has suddenly become trivial in the face of uh, these ecological transformations that I'm sure everyone is aware of. Um, and um, they're happening outside this uh, parochial scope of economics that's so tightly and kind of like arbitrarily wrapped around the figure of the human, centralized uh, around this figure of the human that doesn't really see the material building blocks of its theories. Um, and for long, people on the left have been concerned with how to schedule this shift to communism. Uh, whether by a two-step program from some kind of like a lower phase based on remuneration of socially necessary labor time, um, like a more like hardcore kind of like Marxist um, um, analysis, which is kind of like present and foregrounded in, for example, participatory economics um, or progressive ta taxing uh, or universal basic income, which are all some kind of like um, reform uh, strategies. Um, before kind of like amping it up and jumping towards a higher level of communism, which um, really started since Marx and the debates around full automation of labor um, and now with peer-to-peer -peer production of knowledge online. But my personal take is um, knowing how short a time we have to address these questions, um, I think maybe a radical thinking of the second order of the higher kind of aspirations of communism should be in place. Uh, and we need to think about planning, um, not in terms of the management of scarcity, uh, which is really kind of the fault of the Soviet, uh, Soviet planning system. Um, and I find it a bit regressive, but for the management of abundance, that's really necessary for an ecologically conscious mode of production and distribution. Um, and this means that I think in the first place, the human figure that's written stone in the figure of homo economicus as the um, healthy, uh, straight, white, Christian, European male, um, it has to be dismantled for good. And so labor should also be understood in broader terms of energy expenditure and the labor that's already inscribed in the material board um, as a derivative of histories of slavery and colonialism, um, while we include biodata and biosimulations in, in our concepts of planning. So it really has to be like a multi-scale, multi-channel multi fight. Um, and it's only, um, it is only, and this is like a, it's not only a question of another word, uh, but as, as David Harvey mentions, it's uh, the question of another communism, not the previous forms of communism. So just to very quickly um, address the role of art in all of this before showing an excerpt of the film, because this is after all a film festival and my background is in filmmaking. I, I'm, I was trained as a filmmaker, but like recently, I, I guess in the past few years in my artistic work, these questions of um, the non-anthropomorphic forces that are shaping our re lived realities has become very central. And, um, thinking of um, how a commonly understood the like, humanistic and experiential field um, such as art uh, can respond to this, um, especially in thinking about financialization and mathematical modeling uh, that work on the level of abstraction. Um, I think there are two ways to think of the function of art here, just very quickly. One is um, as a storyteller which can potentially, let's say, in an, like, importantly, in an expanded cross-disciplinary effort, not just on its own, it can tell a story that's stronger than the myth of money and the market and those fictions that Lauren just talked about with Simon. Um, um, and it can kind of like replace that story with another story. 
Um, and we know that fictions have to replace one another. Like we can't ever let go of these fictions, at least not so far. Um, and secondly, as a sensorial trigger and a negative embodiment of abstraction. But like, I kind of want to leave that last question open-ended because um, it's really the question of what our senses mean to these, you know, these levels of abstraction. And I just want to play an excerpt of the film uh, with the time I have. Hopefully, uh, it would go like maybe a couple minutes over time. But I'm just playing it. И вот кибернетика впервые в истории человека позволила заглянуть немножко в будущее. То есть уже сегодня на современном этапе развития кибернетики можно ставить вопрос о следующей ступени увековечения личности человеческого бессмертия. Когда э, человек, творец, может оставлять потомство не только готовые результаты своего труда, но и свой творческий метод. И не исключено, что придет такое время, когда будет возможен переход человеческого интеллекта и чувств, эмоций полностью память электронной вычислительной машины. Прекращение существования человека в этом новом кибернетическом облике может произойти либо в силу несчастного случая, который никогда не исключается, либо в силу собственного человеческого желания. Ну, примерно так, как это, скажем, сказано у одного из моих любимых поэтов Гёте в его знаменитом Фаусте. Когда воскликну я мгновенно, прекрасно ты, продлись, постой, тогда готов мне цепь пленения. Земля развердлась предо мной, мою неволю разрешая, пусть смерти зову слышу я, и станет стрелка часовая, и время минет. Виктор Викторович, хотели бы обрести бессмертие с помощью компьютера? Да, конечно, да. Наши прошлые представления о будущем вновь не смогли предсказать настоящее. Мы пока не живем и не умираем в верочках. Интернет-магазины лучше всех знают, что мы пока не готовы отказаться от телесного опыта. Желание дотронуться до того хлопкового платья и проверить, насколько остроты лезвия, еще никуда не делись.
Возможно ли вообразить будущее изобилие, не прибегая к дискурсу конечности? Финансовые инструменты служат покупке неограниченных ресурсов из будущего, которые в любом другом случае остаются для нас недоступными. Сегодня геология и экосистема Земли, умноженные на неограниченный фактор времени, являются базой для операций на рынке деривативов. Эта масштабность неизбежно ассоциируется с механизмом глобальной финансовой системы. Слишком активное расширение, вещи выходят из-под контроля. В то же время уверенность, с которой финансы продвигаются в этом бесконечном будущем, это иллюзия, о чем нас предупреждают пагубные экологические изменения. Как нам учесть и понять эти массы пространства и времени? Любая попытка чувственного восприятия этого нового возвышенного приведет к коллективной тревоге и дальнейшей репрессии будущего. Но человечество не первый раз сталкивается с подобной проблемой учета. Yeah, so um, I think I'm uh, finished with the talk. Um, I'm just passing it back thank to you. you. Thank you, thank you, Bahar. Thank, thank you, you for, so much. Thank you for doing this. And um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, After Scarcity is actually available to watch on dis.art as well. So you can watch the full 30-minute uh, uh, film um, today. All right, thanks a thank lot. Thank you. Take right, care. Bye-bye.
Hi, um, thank you for sticking with us. Um, this next session is Army of Love. Uh, loneliness can be a deadly, uh, a deadly epidemic as well. Um, while we practice social distancing in order to protect each other, the negative effects of social isolation is clear, but what to do about it is not. Oceana de Amor by Alexa Karolinski and Ingo Nierman is a docu-fiction produced in Cuba that portrays 10 volunteer members of the Army of Love carrying out daily routines while answering questions about love and labor. Here in one of the few remaining socialist countries, the members of the army describe an automated future in which distributing love will be the only form of work. Alexa Karolinski and Ingo Nierman are joined in conversation with curator, art historian, and writer Chus Martinez today. It's me. The film as well uh, can be seen as part of the CPH um, uh, New Visions category, uh, and you can watch that online um, as well. So let's start off by watching the trailer, and then we will um, hear from Alexa Ingo and Chus. Y realmente yo necesito eso. Y realmente yo necesito eso. Es una, es, yo a veces en la vida no todo está por gusto. ¿A qué te refieres? Porque increíble, yo soy una persona que, que necesito tanto eso. Y mira, estoy aquí. ¿Qué tipo de amor te gustaría que te diera la amada de amor? ¿Qué te necesito? A ver. Darme, no sé de que Ana Ivy puedes lograrlo, puedes seguir a pesar de todos los problemas. No te hundas en la depresión. Una ayuda, aunque sea verbal, una inspiración, una fuerza, de que no todo se ha perdido. A pesar de que estés como estés, tienes amor, tienes el amor de tu mamá. Fuerza, voluntad, inspiración de que, de que sí se puede y también una, una ayuda económica porque no tenemos ni para comer. Yo, en estos días, la ayuda económica es importante, pero de la seguridad de que, se, de, de que puedo continuar también es bastante. Hi, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys take it away from here. I think the first question is kind of obvious, which is, um, did you ever thought in all your speculative scenarios about such a change of uh, circumstances? I did. Ingo, I think you can talk, even if the camera mm. is not on mm -hmm. because of the connection. Mm. I think you can, you can say, I think, what motivates you to do the movie? And also, how do you see the movie now that people can really not touch each other? Alexa? Well, it's something we have been th talking about since this whole thing started, is obviously the whole definition of the ar army of love is that people learn to love each other again by means of touch. Um, so I guess in this time, the structures of the army of love need to change, but we've also talked about group isolation um, where are you with this, Ingo? Um, um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, of course, people can still can still touch each other. It's um, um, but we, of course, not. But you cannot do it, or people are not inclined to do it with strangers. And for me, this the situation reminds me very much. I think they were they. Of course, they would would have been something completely different if we would have uh, started it, let's say, in 1975, yeah? Um, so, and our exercises, and uh, you can you can see it also in, in the film, they also include um, uh, sometimes distance. They even work with distance. There's gazing exercises, yeah? It's, uh, it's not all, it's not, Oh, and there's conversation. It's not all about touch. 
Um, and sometimes we have situation because it's not as films, we as well did um, re what we call recruitments. And for instance, sometimes we have the problem uh, that some people are not able to touch others because uh, of their disabilities. Yeah, like when you have muscular dystrophy, you're not able to touch someone else. So we had to work with proxies. Uh, that means you give orders for to a third party to touch someone else. And this could as well, for instance, be done. For instance, imagine you have, um, you're with someone, someone you can, you can trust where you, where you're in this kind of, um, um, group isolation. And then you have someone from the outside of people that actually wanted to isolate themselves. And we have been creating in the last 20 to 30 years, technologies and dreams that are all about not to meet, not to touch or relating virtually and so on. So don't you see Army of Love as more political than ever? Because even despite the fear, um, we need to get immune. I think there is no other way. I think we yeah. may perish, but part of survival is about touching. If you don't touch each other, uh, the possibilities of dying out of it are even higher. So the question is, um, the movie now has an incredible political um, dimension that has been even gained through that uh, through that uh, fear. So how do, how do you reflect on that? I mean, I agree with Chus. I have to say, Ingo, I'm not with you on this one because I have to say that um, the whole definition to me of the army of love is through touch. And while there are exercises of gazing, it's in a way the way the recruitments have been structured and the way is is the gazing is really just the beginning. And even when people have disability, like people with muscular dystrophy and there's a and there's a proxy in those it, it's in fact all the more important that those people are touched, even if they can't touch. Like that that's to me the whole reason for the army of love to exist is so that that those people get touched as well. I'm with truth. I believe, um, I believe that the army of love needs to either change to adapt to these circumstances. And I don't, I don't really have the answers yet. I don't believe the answer is the not touching. I think that, you know, I think the people who need to be touched, there needs to be, um, yes, those, the, the people need, um, I don't know, herd isolation together. I don't, I'm not really sure, but uh, I don't think the army of love can exist um, without touch. Of course, this is, uh, um, but you have to see, I as well completely agree. Of course, touch is is crucial, and one has to find ways to have it for uh, and and the situation which we're in. I don't assume it's permanent because if it would be permanent, it would be the end to a lot of things, and not just problematic for the army of love. But yes, how how uh, if you would live in this kind of state of complete fear and uncertainty? So of course, this will this will disappear. But what might not disappear, or for most of us, it will disappear, but maybe not for some people. So I, I'm, I had these discussions like with a friend who is a virologist, and it might be actually that for till there's a vaccine for the coronavirus, against the coronavirus, or a really good, good um, drug uh, that keeps it under control, some people will will isolate have to be isolated yeah. but even then of course still touch is is possible you can do uh, the touch itself is not and this is something we have to be aware the touch itself is not infectious it's not no one gets infected by one hand touching the other's body it's not true it's this is not the way of infection the way of infection goes goes um <clears throat> You have to inhale it. Uh, you, it's maybe a problem when you then again touch the same spot. So you, one can be really intelligent about creating new exercises that not only work about distance. Distance is a very kind of very rude way. And it's a bit as really as in the AIDS crisis when people were 
suddenly they were afraid of kissing even, you know, they thought even being close to someone who is infected could, um, could be a danger. And now we have this like rules. Okay. You have to keep two meter distance, but it's not true. For instance, if we do, and some of our exercises are back to back and back to back, yeah. there is no danger of getting infected for instance. So, um, but, but it will take, take some time. And, and of course, some really building up trust again in, into, into contact to overcome this like very, very rude ways of, of being isolated from each other. That will, that for most people, it won't be a problem. They, they probably, as it looks now, they will get immunity without but much effort and but then we have a like a yeah, two-class society of those who can still touch each other carelessly and the others they are they are completely isolated but let's say that i would get really aggressive mm. with the message because it's really not anymore a question of a metaphor or an exercise about emotion and empathy but it's really an So there is a bit of a, you know, sometimes there is a bit of an exchange and you do, you have eye contact and you know, you always wonder if it's more an eye contact of solidarity or if it's more an eye contact of fear. And, uh, but there's always some ambiguity in it and something very, I don't know, it's, it's really, it's really stressful. And I, I would always assume, you know, and I don't want to, um exoticize but uh i'm i'm sure if um the situation in in cuba gets uh just as problematic that uh, and they would go for similar measurements that this this would be different yeah i i cannot imagine it to be like it i don't know what it's like in la but um well what's really interesting is as you know i have seven eight month old twins mm -hmm. So when I'm outside these days, it's mostly just to go for a walk with these babies. And as soon as you have like two babies next to each other that are that young, it invites really actually never really a look of fear. Mm -hmm. But there's always this moment when I'm passing by somebody on the street today, like in this virus that seems to also be connecting people at, on some level, mm -hmm. even through the look is like, okay, do we talk or do we not talk? And I would have to say that 99% of old ladies um, always want to talk, like stop and talk and talk about what it's like to have babies in this time, like how they are, like it somehow feels that older women and babies have a, a kind of own connection that's like the circle of life connection that I also feel to me is like very much what the army of love has always been about. Um, I mean, that I'm trying to hold on to that in L.A. because L.A. has the potential to become really, really dire because there's such a, a large amount of homeless uh, people here and the healthcare system is bad. And it, it hasn't even the numbers aren't even that high yet in L.A. because people isolated so quickly and nobody can get tested, actually. But the hospitals already don't have enough um, masks, and and you know, LA is not Switzerland. Um, Switzerland is not Switzerland, <laughs> huh? No, nothing is holding to itself. That's the interesting <laughs> part of it. So it's really interesting uh, to talk about it, and also uh, thinking about giving the army of love as a proposition again. You know, when you did it, it was a proposition, but it was a proposition thinking that people know about it and then you can practice it more or less. And it has some sort of uh, spe speculative, but also naive, but now it's not naive anymore at all. Like now it's just very, a very pragmatic proposition, touch, just do it. Um, and, and I think that, um, that this um, in relationship with uh, generations is gonna be very difficult. It's gonna be difficult that generations touch each other again in the same way for for a while and i i wonder and this is going to affect new ways of discriminating others for a long time and i think that the army of love should continue and that you should uh, actually think about how to overcome or how to go further from this movie i don't know if you are thinking about it no 
I'm, I'm thinking a lot about it and uh, you, you're completely right, of course. And uh, I, I, um, I would love actually to do something qu quite urgently that is dealing with exactly really and I mean, we started, I mean, we, we started the conversation already about what it could be like in these times to, to insist exactly to insist on touching and uh to insist on contact to insist on any kind of intimacy and i find these ideas oh okay now it's nice all this like handshaking and hugging is over wasn't it always anyhow a bit enforced and and i i for me people this say that hmm? people say that yes of course you see it like everywhere it's like okay we can do it more the other way and look at at how uh barack obama is doing it like you know doing it the asian way and um All right yeah oh my god and i i think this is and of course of course one thing is to know yes you can show a commitment you can show intimacy without touching it is possible and we are not experienced enough in it that's one aspect, but the other is there are ways, even even in this like situation of super high alert, where you can touch strangers, uh, and it's completely non dangerous. Alexa, any thought on that? <clears throat> I mean, it's tricky to, if we, I mean, this, uh, to me, this goes into the other direction. If we, as the army of love go out and, and tell people how they can touch and it still be safe, we'd have to involve, I do believe we'd have to involve like your friend who's the viro, viro, virologe in English. Mm -hmm. Virologist. The, virologist. Um, because of course. The He's just scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You like, will not touch. Who are we like, to tell people? Who are we to tell people how they can touch and guarantee they won't get sick? I mean, alone the fact that, you know, I had this moment yesterday, you know, where this I almost like put the babies into this old lady's hand on the street. And I was like, I can't because my children might be carrying something that could make this older lady sick. Um, and I don't want that responsibility in a way. I I, I love the notion of of us developing something so that people who 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 don't have the privilege of living with somebody who they can touch or you know. Um, but there was never a guarantee. There was never a guarantee, of course not. But it seems that now more than ever, people crave a guarantee. I mean, they watch five minute videos on how to wash their hands. You know. Um, yeah, but perhaps in Spain we are paying for it. I don't know. We never wash our hands. I think, yeah, I, I think ironically I think speaking, I would, so I would you say that. For it. Yeah, we never wash our hands. There is, a, there is cultures that are not based on this type of safety. And, right. um, and but I, I do think also that we will survive. You know, I think the but question is, what do you want to survive? Because now it's also when the real important questions come. What do you want really to survive? Do you want to live in that plastic bag forever? Mm. Or I think not, not really. I think how much can we also stand this situation? And also, what do you want to survive? That That's fundamental, no? And I would say that after that, um, we we really need, or during that, we really need to ask ourselves, about about new protocols because the protocols that are going to be installed by simplistic ways of thinking and protection um, are going to just jump on the top of us with and we need to be ready for contesting that and you can only contest things by doing it differently you cannot say you just need to do it and that's going to be the difficult part i think how to produce a behavior that is not safe but is still um advisable uh, for the sake of a political life that preserves freedom. I think that's that's a beautiful note to end on, Chus. Um, I want to just thank both of, I mean, all of you. Thank you yeah. all for, for being here and talking to us. And I want to encourage all of um, everyone who has access to the CPH market 
uh, to go um, watch the film there. Um, congratulations on that. Uh, and yeah, best of luck in these very difficult times as we try and reevaluate what, what is sustainability? What do we want to sustain? What values do we want to bring with us forward? I think the Army of Love is really um, the perfect place to begin all of that. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, welcome to uh, CPH conference, day five, documenting the future. Uh, our fourth session uh, right now is Beyond Borders. Um, the latest film by Christopher Clinton Thomas in collaboration with Annika Kuhlman is Being Human. And it examines the idea that creativity is a humanist fiction and that human rights is often um, just a cover for imperial ambitions. Christopher and Annika are joined today by with um, Caroline Busta and Julianne Wadsworth, two co-founders of New Models, a podcast and an anti-algorithm media platform covering contemporary topics in art, politics, and culture. Um, I'd like to start just by playing the first uh, very short clip, uh, and then we'll open it up to our panelists. Um, long version, music video. Well, the idea of the individual upon which human rights is based uh, derives from Kant's definition of the universal human subject, distinct from nature. And uh, maybe the problem is not something that can be fixed within human rights or international law. Uh, maybe the problem is, is with the category of human itself. need to be authentic 
everybody demands authenticity, and every artist believes that they're for real. I mean, I believe that I'm genuine in what I'm doing, but that's the paradox, because so does everyone else. You know, everyone believes that even if the whole industry is corrupt, at least, you know, I'm true to myself. So, if believing in your own authenticity is the basic price of admission, then authenticity itself becomes the most contested object of synthesis. And behind your likes and follows and your friends and meals and possessions and vacations, behind the ranking algorithms and social graphs, maybe simulating simulated behavior is the only way we have of being for real. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, welcome back. Um, thank you for sharing that clip with us. Um, that's Being Human um, by Chris Brickland and Thomas um, in collaboration with Annika Coleman. Um, now we have Caroline and um, Julian. Uh, I don't know if you how you want to begin. Maybe um, Christopher, you want to say a couple words um, about what we just saw, and and then we can get it started. Sounds well, Annie, good. Do you, Annie, do you want to uh, introduce that clip? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, as Lauren said, that was a clip from Christopher's and my um, film being human. Um, and what you were seeing is actually not straight up the film, but this documentation of our recent show, Ground Zero, um, which happened at Schinke Pavilion in Berlin um, from September to December. And um, so basically what you were looking at is a documentation of the film playing in the space. And um, what you saw, the framed um, image is basically a transparent projection screen on which the film is projected. And then um, at times throughout the film, which um, might not have been so clear in documentation, the image actually disappears and reveals behind it um, kind of a show within a show um, that we installed there. It's um, works by Sri Lankan artists, um, in this case, Kingsley Gontilake and Upali Ananda, 
who are um, artists who have become successful in the recently developing contemporary art market in Sri Lanka. And so we kind of presented these works behind the transparent screen as a show within the show that becomes kind of like a fourth character um, in the film itself, actually. And the film was originally commissioned um, by the VAC Foundation for um, an exhibition that we did um, in Venice for the last Venice Biennial. Um, in the beginning of the year, the show was called um, Time Forward. And that's when we initially presented the film. And it's now on display in San Francisco at the Young Museum. Or at least, at least, at least, you will be able to see it if anyone's streaming this from from San Francisco. You will be able to see it when you're let out of your homes again. Um, and, and the installation there it will be it won't be a projection. It will again be in an installation with artworks in a similar fashion. Exactly. So the film was made to be presented in this specific way as a projection onto a screen. So it very much interacts with the space that it's shown in and the space itself, which is, a, I guess, a contemporary art gallery, um, depending on where you show it. Each museum obviously has a specific space. So the um, presentation changes and adapts to the spatial surroundings and picks up the specific aesthetics of that space. And what we saw now, Shinka Pavilion is obviously quite specific. It's a octagonal um, exhibition space. Um, and for this show, the silver um, shutters that you see behind the screen is actually, there's usually windows there. So we shuttered them um, for the specific presentation. Excellent. Um, maybe we can speak for, for, for a second about a the structure of, of the film. Yes, but please go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, could you say that again, please, Craig? Oh, I, I was going to say we could, we could also now speak the structure of the film, uh, but please, Chris, Chris, do you have, have something else you yeah, want to sure. say? No, about absolutely, I, I can say something about that. Um, so uh, the film that's projected into uh, um, this installation uh, features um, my uncle, uh, who is a, uh, a human rights activist. Um, uh, it also features a um, a Norwegian artist of Tamil descent uh, by the name of Ilavinil Jayapalan. Um, and uh, it features a couple of um, uh, uh, digitally synthesized uh, deep fake uh, simulations um, of a well known painter um, and um, uh, a very famous pop star who. Uh, you saw in the last clip, um, and uh, those uh, two synthesized characters and the artist Ilavanil Jayapalan are all guests um, of the Colombo Art Biennial, uh, which is a biennial that was um, founded in the immediate aftermath of um, the ethnic cleansing in Sri Lanka that ended the Sri Lankan civil war um, and that wiped out um, the uh, Tamil uh, homeland of Elam, uh, uh, which is where my family is from. Um, and, uh, and when that happened in 2009, um, the sort of uh, the, the liberal uh, democratic conception of human rights um, was kind of part of the problem in that it gave cover for the international community of nation states to avoid intervening uh, to prevent um, what many people are now recognizing as a genocide. Um, and then curiously, in the aftermath of that violence, um, a new contemporary art market um, established itself uh, almost overnight in the Sri Lankan capital, Colombo, uh, with the first sort of Western style white cube uh, commercial galleries um, opening up in 2009 and uh, creating a new uh, market for um, a, a generation of, of Sri Lankan artists influenced by the Western art historical uh, canon. Um, and I think the next clip here um, uh, refers to, uh, to that history. So the, the film is really uh, a kind of art uh, it's a kind of art history essay 
uh, it in a way that that looks at the relationship between um, between contemporary art as a art historically specific genre and human rights, um, uh, which the film kind of um, looks at as as the aesthetic and the juridical expression of the same uh, kind of uh, liberal values. But, um, but this installation kind of looks at that connection between human rights and contemporary art through the prism of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so I think we can, we can probably watch the next clip which looks at that kind of, um, uh, that, uh, that contemporary art uh, context. No, this is the same, this is the same clip. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we need to watch the other clip. We need to watch. The galleries that have opened here since the end of the war have very quickly created a new market for contemporary art. This is supported by major cultural events like the Colombo Art Biennale and it's a function of Sri Lanka's newfound economic prosperity. Supposedly, art created a way for this country to heal. They claim that this has created like an experimental space here, a space for oppositional viewpoints, a space for new ideas, for, uh, for freedom of thought. Basically, it's created a space for democratic values. This is contemporary art, and nowadays it is everywhere. But what exactly is it, and how did it get here? Okay, okay. I'm missing Anka, but okay. Turn your Wi-Fi off on your phone. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Uh, okay, our signal looks strong. We actually didn't re refresh our room because our signal is well. It's at four, four bars. We are worried. About it. We're actually worried about it, just not being able to join again. Okay. Great. So, uh, okay, thank you. That was beautiful, Chris Annika, when she's back in the room. Um, so before we saw the second clip, you spoke about this being uh, a kind of uh, like an, an essay that, that used history as a lens to talk about the problem that uh, our laws and causes as, as a kind of making a nice pathway for capital to clear out other occurs. But of course, of course, um, pop, you know, Sorry, are we on? Or, yeah. Can you hear us? Yes. There's sound coming Can you hear us? from somewhere or, else. Yeah, there's extra sound. Okay. Um, so, but also, of course, pop, pop, pop culture uh, plays a very, very strong role in, in this. Um, um, I, I, I'm slipped between to ask you, you some, do some technical questions about um, about sort of how you put the elements of this together. Actually, maybe we can we can start there, and then we can do more philosophical. Um, so, uh, cent central to this, what we just the first clip we saw was this sort of re-engineered, reverse-engineered pop, pop song starring a very, very famous pop star. Um, but uh, it, it's it's you you used uh, you use this smart like formula. Somehow you, you re-engineered that. You use you, you you speak about Duchamp in the film, and you, you speak about uh, the the people people and about this new generation of art. But there's also this strong like pop kind that runs through work work. Um, I yeah I. I wonder and pop is an extension also operating on half, half algorithm algorithm itself it's exactly. algorithmic function. It, it functions more like it all than it does as, as, as we imagine art to function um do you, you want, want to speak a little bit of the process of putting this together to get what role pop play played what role that kind of algorithmic cultural product production played in the production of our film film and well, all, all the other creative uh, sorry also all the other other almost like a miss on a beam of creative creative structures right because you made this for the venice ballet but uh, you in in the process as you were uh framing framing 
uh, uh, Sri Lankan art and artists that were in white cube gallery galleries that were also attached attached to Columbia and LA. Then you you also must have worked with a good D, good DP, a uh, sound engineer, um, a, a, a whole uh, a slew of different artists to and cultural cultural officers to create this film. So maybe you can, maybe you can speak about some of the other stars that were in play. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, uh, so maybe while I say a few words about that, Carly and Julian, you might want to um, uh, refresh your browser or rejoin the room because I think your sound is um, it's pretty weird. And also, um, it, I think our engineer should know that Annika is trying to rejoin the room, uh, but um, she is in a room on her own with a panic button, which sounds hilarious and terrifying. Um, cool, okay, great. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, maybe one way of thinking about the pop angle is um, uh, that, uh, I mean, for example, that um, pop song that, um, uh, that you saw just now, um, the first clip we played, um, uh, we, we made that, um, with um, a composer, Aaron David Ross, uh, who we worked with to basically reverse engineer um, Max Martin's uh, um, secret songwriting system that he calls melodic math. Uh, for those that don't know who Max Martin is, um, uh, he's arguably the most successful music producer like ever. Um, uh, and he started sort of back in the day with um, like Britney, Backstreet Boys and, and whatnot. But by now he and his, his crew in, in Stockholm are behind a good, a, a, a good proportion of, uh, of, of the pop charts in the West from uh, Taylor Swift to uh, Ariana Grande or Katy Perry or, um, or, or whoever, um, and uh, and Max Martin has this secret songwriting system that he calls melodic math, which are, which are uh, the rules behind his chart-topping hits. So nobody knows really how that works because he's very secretive about it. Um, so we tried to reverse engineer that by um, by analyzing um, all of Max Martin's Taylor Swift um, songs. Uh, his Taylor Swift back catalogue. Um, and you and did then, you did that computationally, or you did that through more organic means? How well, did you? I mean, you know, it's a secret, it, but what was yeah, that? like no, no, it's like a, it's a com a combination of of um, uh, of uh, of human and non human processes, as is kind of a lot of of how we made this film. We we tried to automate. Um, uh, any kind of filmmaking process that that, that made sense to, um, uh, from you know the 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 deep fake characters that that you saw, to um, to uh, scraping the internet to look for uh, certain like shots to uh, to find art documentation um, in one particular part of the of the film that that uses art documentation to to um, to kind of synthesize our version of another artist's work that features other kinds of found footage. Um, so yeah, I mean, whatever we 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 could do quickly, we we uh, we automated because the I mean the the film we actually made in quite a short period of time. Um, how big big was your team? Can you just say like how big 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 how big production team you're working with? All, all told, because it's, it seems like it's you know very. Like, Drawing work, work, but I know you guys are also very crafty about, about the way you produce things. And uh, yeah, can you give us a sense of what that structure was like? Annie, do you want to jump yeah, in? Yes, since I'm back, I'm no longer alone in a room with a panic button. I'm, <laughs> I'm here. And um, yeah, actually, we, um, you know, we have a team of long term collaborators who we've been working with for the last four years already. And thankfully, they came along for this ride as well. So um, we shot the film in Sri Lanka with like um, two directors of photography, um, Josef and Christoph. And we worked with Anthony again, who edited the film together with Jan, who then also, you know, programmed the neural networks. Um, 
Aaron David Ross did um, the music um, with us and composed our amazing Taylor Swift song. And, um, and then there was like a whole other network of supporters and people who we've been working with, Franca and Julian helped us produce the film in Berlin. Um, but in a way, I feel like it's, or how we've come to work over the last year is to have like this, yeah, this very core family team and then, you know, an ability to kind of expand and to contract um, depending on how we need it. But I think it was quite a heavy ride for everyone involved, actually. And I remember like the four weeks that we were in Venice kind of finishing the film on site because there was no other way you could have had to produce it in response to the spatial setting, right? Like that was like a really intense working <laughs> around the clock period that I'm sure Anthony and Jan also fondly remember. <laughs> but uh, but really the whole thing happened within the space of, I mean, we shot for 10 days in uh, in Sri Lanka, in, in Colombo and in, in Jaffna, um, and then edited for a few weeks um, uh, in Berlin and then on site in, in, in Venice for the premiere. We shot in the beginning of March and then we premiered the film on May 7th. So that was... Yeah that time span. Yeah, but I, I think the, 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 the process that probably took the longest was synthesizing um, these two characters. So um, Annika and, and our collaborator Jan built uh, two computers that we had running uh, these machine learning algorithms for uh, a couple of months um, to, uh, to synthesize the, the two deep fake characters. Um, in the film. But you know, I want to add to that actually because the same that the film actually in, in a sense calls into question this concept of like an individual creativity right and that like genius cult around that I think the same way our film really emerged from our network of collaborators that we made it with and I think that's a really important core quality of that film and we couldn't have made it if it wasn't for like all you know, the individual talents and perspectives that came together and each added something unique to the mix. And um, I think that, yeah, I really, everyone made their, their mark on the film and it would have been a different film if it, we had a different team, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. In terms of the characters of the film, uh, it's it seems that Taylor Swift, if we've been avoid <laughs> dancing <laughs> this whole time. Um, I mean, she as, as as a foil, though, right? We should should be skeptical of of, of what she says. She's kind of kind of the age of of a uh, global capital the narrative of your film and its, its characters. When she she says leading related behavior is the only way to be to be real or something to that effect, we're supposed to be skeptical of that statement. Is that fact? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think we probably. Each of us might have a different view on that, um, because I, I think that is part of the ambiguity of the film's narrative. I would say uh, I, I'm not sure if if I, I say that because because that isn't my response to it. Um, I I see Taylor Swift's um, the, or that kind of synthesized characters' um, uh, thoughts about this, what you just described, as um, a moment of uh, of self awareness and mm. kind of deeply truthful insight into uh, kind of what it means to be human in the age of planetary scale computation. Yes, can um, we actually actually then speak about the other the other which the protagonist who I, who I guess is your or cousin who uh, is sort of the protagonist in the film, um, he, he prompts us, he says, you know, maybe the problem in right, right the category of human itself. Um, and there's a, a, there's a lot of references, the idea that, that if you uh, facilitate capital, or maybe not capital as human, there's a different point, point in the film, we did not, not be in one of these clips, um, he talks talks about the survivors of of the two thousand nine crisis and and how you know what it how one could even be counted as a casualty what we had to to do to register uh, as worthy to be counted as one of the casualties and so uh, maybe can you speak for a moment about this problem of of the of human category right like why why that why one would say there's a problem with the category of human yeah I mean. Um... Uh, there 
is a broad disagreement between the Sri Lankan government that um, has minimized the uh, the death toll of um, uh, of that war um, and uh, and many Tamils um, that know that a lot more uh, civilians were killed uh, than the government um, uh, is is saying and um, and I think you know more broadly uh, the um, uh, the the idea that we are human is perhaps the fiction that um, this work kind of looks at in the in the, when we think of ourselves as human we, we don't use that term as a biological uh, category description we mean something more um, it, uh, it's um, it's a perhaps religious belief or uh, an ideology um, that uh, um, was maybe you know like concretized in a particular juridical system that after the Second World War um, became the the front line of um, uh, a particular uh, world view uh, and uh, and a particular empire and. Um, and with that empire comes a particular political system that we call democracy and 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 so on and that's fine um, but uh, but in 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 some parts of the world like where my family's from uh, that also has devastating consequences and um, so uh, I, I think this work um, uh, looks at that kind of fiction that we are human from all these different angles, right? From, uh, from you know, through the, the kind of fiction of creativity to, uh, um, to uh, uh, the contemporary art um, a market that has uh, has emerged in in Sri Lanka to um, uh, to the story of of my uncle, who's a human rights activist that set up. Um, the center to investigate government war crimes, um, and that's uh, that's maybe the, the the most sort of documentary part of, of of this this film. It's also why it's interesting for us to be talking about this work in the context of a documentary festival, because um, uh, because um, it because our film sort of uh, adopts the aesthetic form of a documentary. Kind of looks like a documentary, um, but doesn't really do what um, what perhaps documentaries are are meant to do, which is to tell the truth. Or is it? I don't know oh. if that's what documentaries are meant to do. We, we other, know other, about other, documentaries, but um, there are truths that you come through, right? So, like the truth that one one might take from this is that the category of human or this this notion of human rights in, in quotes and the category of, of art specifically contemporary art are, are often deployed to pave away for, for something that's more sinister Say, saying like right. we're doing this for, for human rights we're doing this so that cont contemporary art can thrive but, but at, at what cost right and so i feel like the, the, if there's a truth that, that comes through if this is a document this, this this can be read in a documentary context that's sort of that's sort of the, the truth that's being revealed would, would you agree with that yeah totally you're pretty harsh on, on, on contemporary art in, in, yeah, yeah. in general, I think. I mean, you have, have a, a, a provision for it, broadly. And also, so, apropos to that, I lied. I mean, you know, great case why contemporary art, specifically in a non content tag, is probably more harm than good. But then, why do you yourself feel that? I mean, it's a bit of a obvious question but then why do you yourself choose to position yourself within within the world why not position yourself in the documentary world it's especially in a time of netflix and each video and there being a lot of fighting and a lot, a lot of circulation value to something something in a documentary sphere why uh yeah yeah why would you choose to remain in a contemporary art con contest or are you actively now seeking other channels um 
uh, I'm just getting a message that uh, the from, from from Annika that she she can't hear um, what we're saying. I think the sound may be bad on her connection. So I just wanted to let you know that 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 Annie's having sound trouble. I don't know if there's anything the um, the engineer here can do about that, but let's see. Cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, so I, until Annie can get back into this conversation, I, I hope I can speak for you also, Annie. Um, uh, I I don't know if either Annika or, or I um, uh, have enough of a, uh, a perspective outside of the art world to, to be able to make a moral judgment on the art world. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, uh, I don't. Um, I, I I don't think that contemporary art is bad and evil or anything. Um, and uh, we 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 do art, and and I can I can talk about I guess what we find interesting about art, um, which which is um, or or certainly in in this in, in the context of this work, I think um, what you have in. Um, in Sri Lanka is this accelerated microcosm to see what contemporary art kind of does in the world. Right? On the front line of these global processes through which cities around the world are transformed. Um, and I guess uh, our questions about the art field come from thinking about these kind of structural operations of art, like what art actually does in the world. Um, and maybe that makes us um, uh, um, perhaps like occupy a somewhat fringe position in the art world in that um, in, in that most art people tend not to uh, like talking about what art actually does in the world as if the only consequence of art worth talking about is what it does for its viewers interpretation um, but to me that seems like a somewhat delusional view of um, uh, of uh, of the world, um, and uh, I know Annika and I are more interested in 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 looking at these kind of structural processes that um, that art is involved in. And so, in in a way, this this film uh, that we're talking about is our kind of extended catalogue essay for the exhibition that it's kind of projected onto. It's kind of our way of of um, uh, presenting uh, artworks that we have purchased in a gallery to make a kind of show within a show. And I should point out that this is a show that we have made not at all in collaboration with those artists. Right. Right? The, the galleries in Colombo, the, the Sri Lankan capital, the galleries in Colombo that we have bought the work of those artists from um, uh, um, in no way collaborated in this exhibition, neither did those artists. We, it's, it's a commercial transaction. We, we bought the work of, of some artists who are successful in that contemporary art uh, scene in Colombo, and then made this exhibition a kind of show within a show um, of the work of Upali Ananda and Kingsley Gunatilaka in the case of our exhibition at Shinkle Pavilion maybe different artists in other iterations. Um, and then the film that we project um, uh, kind of on top of it is something like a kind of weird extended catalog essay. Right, it definitely functions in the realm of institutional critique or, or what we might see as institutional critique today. Um, I wonder, since I know we don't have that much time, I wonder, I wonder if we could just for a second to our present condition. Here we all are, all under in quarantine time um, of COVID-19. Uh, and talk for, for a second about some other work, specifically your new Elam project, which uh, discusses uh, sort of platform utopia, um, a, uh, an extension of the Elam that was interrupted uh, in the audience. Uh, and reconceived as a kind of share platform. Um, do you want to speak briefly about what that project is uh, and how it may be read through this global phenomenon of the COVID quarantine? Yeah, if Annika still can't hear us, which it looks like maybe she can't, then then I can. You, you, you can, shall I? 
Annie. Um, uh, yeah, so actually the, the film we're talking about is a kind of prequel to um, a body of work. Uh, it's, it's a kind of backstory behind um, a body of work that um, became as, like it, it kind of began as an artistic proposition um, where um, our, where together with with our collaborators, we uh, we um, uh, uh, kind of presented the idea of a distributed housing cooperative. Um, and uh, when we first kind of presented that idea in the art field, we didn't know how to do it. But through um, presenting kind of concept spaces, kind of show homes um, for this distributed housing cooperative in various exhibitions um, around the world, we we brought together a, um, a brilliant team uh, to figure out how to do it. And then, so last year, I mean that, uh, so that shit got real. And last year, we started uh, we, we 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 started the company to uh, to build this. Um, uh, this housing network for remote working, essentially. And be clear, um, you make a, a one point you make that um, and I think will cinch us. You, you speak about uh, how we've shifted from um, a, a geographical locality to, to a geodesic locality. So the fact that, that we're yeah. now close based on, on our like digital connections uh, more than we necessarily are our geographical connections. And I feel like that salient point in, in, in understanding the, the desire of New Elam. Yeah, exactly, and maybe this this ties in with your um, your question about um, uh, uh, about our current uh, crisis. Um, and in, in fact, we were kind of talking about this uh, together on a completely unrelated uh, panel, um, uh, Carly and Julian, on Tuesday, when uh, the design theorist Ben Bratton um, uh, talked about the COVID nineteen crisis as a large scale, concentrated, if unwanted, um, experiment in comparative uh, governance. Um, and, um, and quite likely uh, the, the result of all of the, uh, the, um, the terror that is about to ensue um, and uh, my feeling is that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better and many of us will lose loved ones. Um, uh, um, but, you know, a consequence from this is, uh, is perhaps likely to be, uh, at least in the short term, stronger nation states and, um, uh, and um, strengthened uh, cultural nationalisms around the world with tightened borders. Um, but at the same time, uh, um, this crisis has accelerated the, uh, um, the trend towards remote working and is likely to leave um, an expanded population of people that can think flexibly about where they want to live. So um, I think, uh, you know, this is a, a, a kind of interesting question for us to think about, about how these seemingly um, opposite uh, trajectories will, will play out where you have perhaps uh, uh, like nation states becoming stronger and, and yet more and more people who will be able to, um, to, uh, um, to, to, to leave. Right. So this, this, this question of, of, of comparative governance um, but becomes, I don't know, like maybe an interesting one. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I don't know how that, I don't know how that. Yeah, out. I mean, in, in your, uh, the, the film that we're speaking of is 60 million Americans can't be wrong. And if anybody wants to, they can go to stuff.r and they can stream it. I think it's been, I think the paywall has been removed time being, time being, so you should it. 
from your quarantine zone. But um, you, you quote Albert Ochman, uh, who, who speaks about the option of leaving being necessary to ensuring full accountability um, among a nation's leaders. So that in order to have a nation state that is accountable, the its, uh, its citizens have, have to be able to leave. So the pretense is that they are in that nation on their own accord, they're being forced to be there. And so, so it seems more important than ever that we're able to create these um, um, geodesic uh, other spaces, geodesic forms of living. We have a, a consolidation of, uh, of national national power. Um, and, and so maybe, maybe New Elam, which I, I imagine you're going to continue working on in the months months to come, uh, maybe an interesting pathway of na navigating that, that particular question. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and uh, as you mentioned, Carly, the... Um, uh, this uh, distributed housing cooperative that we're building is, is called New Elam. Uh, and that word Elam uh, in Tamil um, loosely translates as some version of home uh, as the main character in, in this film we're talking about, Being Human, uh, describes. Um, but it's also the, uh, the name of a place that doesn't exist anymore, which is where my family is from and where, um, where Ilivanil, um, the protagonist in our film, where, where Ilivanil's family is from. Um, and his, his dad, Ilivanil's dad is on the same blacklist as my uncle in, in the film. Um, so uh, I don't think either of them would feel safe about, about returning to what is now um, uh, Sri Lanka. Um, uh, whereas, um, Whereas our, like our family's homeland um, uh, in the north and east of what is now Sri Lanka had been self-governed as a kind of autonomous state um, for, for several decades. Um, and, 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 and I guess a kind of like question that, that all of our collaborators and we are interested in is, is to think about what that idea of self-governance um, could mean now um, if it was to be imagined as a kind of distributed network rather than a territorially like, bounded uh, nation. So that's really the kind of history that, that, that this work kind of looks at. Um, I don't know how much more time we have. I see Lauren pop up. Is this, uh, I could have another question, but maybe this, this is, is also the time to wrap it up. I think we gotta, we're going to wrap it up. Um, okay. uh, I want to I thank you, um, all of you, uh, for joining us today. Uh, such a, a, you know, I guess like eerily well-timed um, conversation to be having right <laughs> now. Uh, as as you mentioned, Carly, you can watch 60 Million Americans Can't Be Wrong um, by Christopher and Anika on Art, which is also free and open uh, to the public to see. So I really recommend everyone check it out. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful film. Um, and hopefully uh, more people will have an opportunity to see Being Human um, in the next year as well. Um, thank you, Annika. Thank you, Julian, Caroline. Um, we'll we'll see you later. All right. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Lovely talking to you all. Bye. Bye.
Hi, so welcome back. Um, this next session is called Canary in a Coal Mine. The economic, technological, and labor conditions of mining and moving resources has become dispersed. Metals are still dug up from the earth, of course, for steel rebar and bridges and lithium and phone batteries, but data, often personal, is also mined. Bitcoins too. Extraction, exploitation, and expropriation also define the treatment of workers managing our increasingly complex global systems. We're joined now by Simon Denny, an artist whose work dives deep into our rapidly changing present. Um, he's gonna give us a presentation on um, one of his most recent projects, uh, Mine. Welcome, Simon. Oh, hey, hey, thanks, Lauren. Oh, hey, thanks, Lauren. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, great, great to be here. Thank you so much uh, to the festival and also to you for having me with this. I think it's kind of an interesting moment to talk through this exhibition that I made in Tasmania called Mine um, at uh, the Museum of Old and New Art um, because also it was, uh, like many shows right now, just recently shuttered um, because of the uh, because of the COVID virus. So nobody in Tasmania um, can come and go. And um, yeah, so it's interestingly, uh, uh, yeah, affected also directly by this. And it's also kind of a very much uh, an experience economy kind of exaggeration. And um, some friends of mine from Nemesis Global uh, put out a report the other day mentioning that um, that we might be at the end of, uh, of the experience economy um, cycle, um, which accelerated through the last decade. And I thought that was an interesting thing because this was like, uh, experience economy, exhibition making, situated documentary like um, extreme. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm, I have some slides that I'm going to play to show you a little bit about what that exhibition was. Um, and uh, so it was at this venue here that you see on the first slide called um, the Museum of Old and New Art in Tasmania. Um, and it's this enormous uh, uh, venue, which is completely kind of uh, milled, almost mined out of the um, out of the cliff face um, of uh, near Hobart in Tasmania. Um, it was started by this guy, um, David Walsh, who um, is a um, uh, I like to describe him as an algorithmic gambling um, uh, uh, philanthropist. Um, he uh, he has a kind of professional gambling company um, that sort of consistently beats the odds um, by making um, better models, uh, better prediction models, um, and applying them to various different gambling scenarios. He kind of skims off the top of the worldwide gambling industry, um, and it's very lucrative. And with that, he set up this um, incredible museum um, and uh, called the Museum of Old and New Art. Anyway, um, skipping ahead, I thought when proposed with doing this um, exhibition, I, I needed to address the site and the context um, as well as the times. Um, and this is what it looks like inside. So it's this crazy, um, amazing kind of like uh, raw rock face cut directly out of the front of, um, of this cliff. Um, and so when you go in there, you kind of enter and you feel like you're going down some kind of mine shaft as it is. It's very, um, it's very raw. Um, this is another view of it. Um, so I thought I'd make my show called Mine and like address um, extraction, both mineral extraction that you kind of like see uh, happening um, all over the earth um, and Australia, of course, uh, as a the, the industry since the colonial times has been, um, you know, one of the strongest industries has been mineral extraction. And that's still super important to uh, the way the country works. Um, and to all sorts of um, conditions uh, under which Australians, Indigenous and uh, colonial live under. Um, um, so yeah, I was thinking about sort of different types of extraction. Those are not only mineral extraction, but also kind of um, also uh, other kinds of extraction that work um, all over the world. So I was thinking about surveillance capitalism. I started reading um, Susanna Zuboff uh, at the beginning of last year when she published this book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And kind of started thinking about, uh, you know, how economic orders can claim uh, human experience as a free raw material for hitting commercial practices of extraction, production, and sales. Um, instead of mining the natural landscape, surveillance capitalists extract raw, ma raw material from the human experience. And I was also looking at um, uh, Kate Crawford and Vlad and Jola's um, Anatomy of an AI System uh, design research kind of masterpiece that they made. Um, 
uh, which mapped um, uh, the entirety of what was needed to keep um, a uh, just a single um, AI working. Um, and that AI that they chose was the Amazon Echo um, device. Um, and in that research, they said it's necessary to move beyond a simple analysis of the relationship between uh, individual human, their data, and any single technology company in order to contend with the truly planetary scale of extraction. Um, and that there are deep interconnections between the literally hollowing out of the materials of the earth and biosphere and the data capture and monitorization of the, of the human practices of communication and sociality. Um, yeah, and they called for a kind of different sort of vision. How, how could we image that process? Um, and Mon is really interesting, the museum, just going back to it, uh, because it um, is a very, very digitally enabled museum. So um, Mona has this incredible uh, platform uh, where you get an eye device um, as you enter the museum and every uh, artwork in the space, um, uh, you encounter it um, uh, also partially mediated by this device. So all the audio guides, all the wall text, everything is kind of on this one device. Um, and, uh, but it also, of course, uh, tracks uh, viewers through, uh, through the exhibition experience. So uh, it's an interesting thing where it's gathering data of viewers as they view artworks. Um, and you can give kind of feedback on it. You can love or hate artworks. Um, and it also knows how long you spend looking at um, an artwork in particular, for example. Um, so I wanted to kind of build on top of that platform. So I built an app within that app uh, with this great team, Art Processes, um, that is a kind of a, a spun out of the museum. Um, it's its own separate company. Um, and uh, yeah, we built an app on top that was an augmented reality way to experience uh, the exhibition. So um, yeah, this is the exhibition rooms. Um, and you start outside from that kind of cavernous space that I showed you before. Um, and you encounter this beautiful diagram that Kate and um, Vladan drew of uh, that tries to envisage every possible system from the beginning of science to uh, mineral extraction to all sorts of complex computational and organizational structures that enable um, an Amazon Echo to exist. Um, and then uh, you uh, go to this, um, uh, this is the kind of entry point um, where, uh, this happens. So this is a little view in your monitor screen that you carry around with you. Um, so it teaches you how to kind of, uh, like a Pokemon Go, kind of animate the experience. So this, an Amazon Echo like pops out of the wall um, on your device here. Um, so that's kind of the, like, yeah, the first moment of augmented reality. Um, and then, uh, then in the next um, room, you kind of you enter the kind of first main space of the three spaces of the show, and you encounter this like crazy uh, cage, uh, this stark white cage um, with a kind of a claw coming out of it. Um, and that cage is actually um, uh, a sort of a, a three-dimensional uh, monumentalization of this drawing that came out of an, uh, a patent that Amazon filed in 2016. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that Kate and Vladen kind of came across in their story that they told in this giant um, uh, diagram. But it's this crazy thing where uh, Amazon, to, in their fulfillment centers, instead of having um, uh, like uh, things on top, like these shelves, which you see in this image, um, you would put like a cage for a worker on top of it. And the algorithmically controlled robots, which move those shelves around, would then be moving around the worker in a kind of algorithmically enabled ballet. So I went to my metal guy, I was like, oh my God, I wanna make a kind of a version of this. Um, I wanna see what this thing looks like. And we kind of popped it out of the page into some kind of bizarre uh, monumental sculptural reality. Um, and this is what it looked like in the end. Um, so you can see kind of one, one of the sculptural things that I did there is I kind of kept uh, some of the patent numbering systems like as sculpture as a part of it. So this kind of sense of being partway between the page reality um, and, uh, and and three dimensions was kind of kept. Um, there's a few other angles on that. At the same time, I was talking to um, scientists that live in uh, Tasmania and work, they live in Australia working in Tasmania, trying to um, like increase the visibility of um, the many, many bird species and other species that are becoming extinct. And this bird, the 
uh, the the uh, 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 King Island brown thornbill um, uh, was potentially thought to only have a few, you know very few in the tens of um, uh, of birds left, um, and I thought okay, wouldn't it be interesting to somehow use the cage for a kind of a simulation of this bird? So um, the uh, the museum uh, collaborated with uh, the Australian National University and um, on on an, uh, an expedition that they were making um, out into the field to try and document this. Um, we asked them to also capture the first audio um, of the bird uh, that had ever been captured, um, which they did for the exhibition. And we used that uh, to animate um, a King Island brown thornbill, the most likely bird to become extinct in Australia, to kind of be inside this Amazon worker cage. Um, and this is sort of what the interface looks like there as well. Um, so you kind of, um, you first of all go in here um, and you see, uh, yeah, the, the the a little animation um, that seems to have stopped somehow. Um, okay. Anyway, um, I'll show you how that works. Uh, so it sort of took you through uh, the the worker cage. It took you through what it was, and then um, if this works, uh, I can show you what the bird animation looked like. And sounded like. So you can see uh, this kind of little bird pop out um, of your screen, and a little bit like a Pokemon Go, um, this this yeah almost extinct bird kind of eerily flies around within the cage. Um, and I also had this live tweet overlay um, with uh, the hashtag climate extinction uh, was kind of coming over. So the the tweet was tweeting as the bird was. Uh, emitting the sound uh, of extinction. Um, yeah, and one of the, um, uh, one of the, one of the, um, one of the crazy things about that was uh, the experience, sorry, I'm just flipping between slides, um, was when many people did it like this, uh, you've got this kind of cacophony of sound. Um, and in, in certain moments, like there were more birds singing out of these devices um, than there were potentially real birds living, uh, which was also extra haunting. So I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about how this was a kind of a, a canary in the coal mine for the entire, um, I guess, like uh, um, industrial um, world, um, if, if you know what I mean. So if industry was, for, you know, was extracting um, as much as it could from workers, um, uh, both human and non-human in different kind of industrial uh, settings. Um, um, and, uh, you know, maybe the, maybe the extension, uh, the extinction of species was kind of like the canary in the coal mine that gives its life um, to, uh, to show humans uh, that uh, the space has become too toxic through industry. Um, so yeah, there's a few different views on that. Here's some, here's some stills on that experience. Um, and the rest of that room. And then there was a second room to the exhibition. Oh, uh, actually, this is a little, some, uh, some prints um, over the top. So some of these renders that were done of this, this bird, which is very hard to photograph. There are only sort of three or four photographs of it in existence, um, superimposed over the top of, uh, of parts of the patent, um, the Amazon worker patent. Um, yeah, and now we go to the next show uh, room which was a kind of complete opposite experience. So it was this giant saturated, as I say, kind of over experience economy uh, glut um, of a, a kind of a trade show board game blow up. Uh, and um, on the floor, you see um, uh, a kind of a, a version of this game, which is called Squatter, which is a very popular Australian board game uh, invented in the mid uh, century, which kind of gamifies um, sheep farming. Um, so you as a player um, are able to use um, sheep uh, and put them on different types of um, developed pasture land uh, and monetize the sale of wool um, in a kind of industrial uh, model. Um, very important, of course, Australia, uh, the other industry that's important than mining is, uh, is, is, is sheep farming, certainly in the beginning of the uh, colonial period. Um, 
but I made my own version of this. So instead of squatter, I did extractor and I kind of overlaid images of mineral extraction, but the game mechanics are actually um, using a kind of a platform extraction model. So um, yeah, this is a cover. We got a, an illustrator uh, to do this, which was um, he usually illustrates games like Red Dead Redemption, like online computer games. Um, and here you have a kind of extraction nightmare, which uh, then also somehow resonated, unfortunately, with uh, the kind of uh, the fires uh, that happened later on this year while the show was still on in Australia. Um, here's the back of that. Um, so here it shows you a little bit of the game. Um, so this actually was not only a part of the show, but it was also the catalog of the show. So you could buy this board game and you can still buy this board game on Mona's website. Um, and uh, yeah, you roll the dice um, and you as a little um, model, like a kind of anthropomorphized uh, uh, a robot um, based on a Namjoon pipe sculpture, um, make your way through. Oh, this, yeah, this is the pipe sculpture that's based on, which is also in the museum. Um, roll through, and gather data, and stack up your data um, on these kind of uh, tweet-like um, stacks. Um, yeah, so the rules was also a, 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 um, a kind of a, a guide to the themes of the show. Um, I'll, I'll kind of skip through these relatively quickly, but we had wonderful essays by, for example, Tony Birch. Um, and uh, then, then there was a kind of list at the end um, of mining automation machines. So the industry of mining in Australia, physical mineral mining, is actually something that is turning into um, a fully automated space where like, you don't need to send workers down mines anymore. Um, the machines do it all. Um, and uh, so I, I used these, um, these products as, um, as the basis for sculptures, um, like this one, which held the board games in place. So um, you can see these kind of giant um, display units uh, based on um, based on kind of drawings again by our uh, game illustrator um, of of various different machines that are involved in fully automating extraction. Um, and uh, here's a hiring platform that's uh, fully automated. Um, here's a here's an automated uh, rail train. And out of these, you could kind of grab your version of the board game extraction. Uh, so they're based on these kind of units, cardboard units. Um, yeah, and this is a different view on that. Um, so here's one which is based on a kind of a tracking device that um, the few workers that go down um, uh, mines now uh, wear, which uh, automates some degree uh, management. So um, it tracks workers' fatigue and you get subbed off. Um, yeah, here's a few angles on that as well. Um, uh, so there was an augmented reality layer to this space as well, so like total saturation. Um, and uh, you kind of walked around with your device um, and activated that. Um, let me just show you how it plays some videos. Um, so here's uh, somebody kind of interacting with um, the kind of video screen mashup. Um, um yeah and uh yeah here again another video showing how you would experience that from another angle hang on uh, so you kind of walk around find your uh zone and then it would start playing advertisements um for these devices um so yeah, there's another uh, video that I'll show you that, uh, oh wait, hang on. Uh, da, da, da. Here's an example of the kind of video that it played. Long wall mining today has turned into data mining as well. In a fully equipped CAT long wall system, there are up to 3,000 sensors collecting and providing data. CAT automated long wall requires less miners in the face during operation. We need technology that makes decisions so that we reach the level of full autonomy. Take command. It's your mind. So that's, that's just ripped directly from um, CAT advertising and slightly edited. Um, and uh, so that gives you a kind of a sense of like how how that worked. Um, so that was actually not for this one. That was um, uh, for this object here, which is a roof support, which kind of makes tunneling fully automated. Um, 
and there was another device uh, using that. Um, uh, so yeah, that kind of played there. So there were several of these around. This is like a giant kind of uh, yeah, cardboard uh, replica of a, a huge um, uh, shearing device uh, for, for shearing coal faces. And coal continues to be one of the most important minerals extracted in Australia. Um, so I'll skip through that. Yeah, Joy Global, believe it or not, is the name of the company that makes that. Um, quite an ironic name. So there was another layer of extraction going on, um, extraction experience going on, um, where uh, you um, also were able to um, scan these and uh, do a kind of a different augmented reality layer, um, which I'll show you right now. Uh, yeah. So your face would be extracted into these kind of minerals um, as well. Um, uh, and then it would kind of, it would map your face as if it was kind of like trying to emotionally track you. And then uh, it would um, uh, then kind of move into a periodic table formation. Um, and European and uh, yeah, it was all of these different minerals were the minerals that are used to make the iOS devices. Um, that you're holding in your hand to do the augmented reality. So there's again this kind of layering of kind of uh, of meta structures um, in the presentation. Um, so yeah, you move around um, the space, interacting with those as well. Um, uh, I have to skip through these slides. Yeah, so people were sort of like in and out of different levels of layers on this uh, uh, augmented reality face. So yeah, um, there's my version. Um, you could also buy, so then the next room was like a buy room for the, uh, for the game. Um, you could grab it out of the sculptures and then kind of buy it over the counter. And here's uh, the curator selling uh, the extraction uh, uh, game to David Walsh, the owner of the, of the, uh, of the museum. Um, incidentally, David said that he played uh, Squatter, the game uh, that uh, the show was based on um, whilst growing up with his brother a lot. And the third and final room was a group show that I asked the money curators, Jared Rowan and Emma Pike, uh, to curate um, with uh, uh, kind of sculptures of uh, human and non-human labor um, in figures. So we built a giant platform and borrowed a bunch of artworks um, from, uh, uh, you know, from, the, um, uh, from other parts of Australia and different parts of the world. Uh, would show uh, like uh, some sort of figurative version of um, of a sculptural uh, yeah worker, let's say. Um, and underneath these, we also had these um, pyramids, which you can see. Um, and those were also kind of uh, triggering this augmented reality layer again, um, which kind of showed you uh, how your data was being used um, during the exhibition. So. Here we go, for example. Um, so you would scan that underneath and it would show you exactly your path through the exhibition, which artworks you saw in which order. And there were like a number of different things, number of different data visualizations that showed you how long you'd been in front of something. Um, it showed you the most liked and disliked worked in the show um, and kind of revealed this data experience um, as well. Um, uh, as, a, as a kind of part of the thing. So I guess the idea was um, to kind of make people uh, aware of exactly what was happening with the, with, with the platform and the whole uh, uh, mining experience. So you as a viewer are being extracted from and, and mined as you're being shown the mechanics of, of as such. Um, it's a beautiful uh, Patricia Pisanini um, classic uh, with two young gamers um, with elderly faces. Um, and the last thing you would see in the exhibition was a version of this sculpture, this Nanjun Pike, um, uh, which I had cast from uh, the, 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 the soil that was being dug up out of the cliff face to actually physically make the room in the museum. So these were casts of mini versions of the Nanjun Pike screen sculptures um, made out of the very stuff that was extracted from the land to make the exhibition space. Um, if you follow that. So uh, 
yeah, screens as um, extraction uh, engines, as uh, gamified, um, uh, I don't know, theme parks to extraction. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, there's Thank Lauren. Thank you. Simon, that was that was amazing, and you know, um, it's actually the the very best um, lead in I could imagine for our um, our next conversation uh, called Machine Eye with Nora Khan and Theo Anthony. Who, if you stick around, um, we'll be talking about the surveillance creep in our in our lives and the cameras. Can't wait. Uh, yep. Yeah. Can't wait. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Bye. Bye. So, seeing is believing, or so it goes. Perhaps that's why visual technologies have often been the first developed or put to use for juridical ends. The French innovated the mugshot to document perceived wrongdoers and to construct a criminal class. Edward Boybridge, Boybridge helped invent motion photography to settle a bet. CCTV is used to solve crimes and increasingly computer vision is implemented to prevent them. I'm joined now by filmmaker Theo Anthony, best known for his feature length film, Rat Film, as well as writer and curator Nora Khan to discuss their interest in vision, surveillance, technology, and justice. Uh, hello. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Hey. Nora, Theo. Um, perhaps, Nora, you, you would not mind um, starting us off just by introducing yourself and your practice and maybe say just a <clears throat> few words about uh, your most recent book, Seeing, Naming, Knowing. Sure, thanks, Lauren. Hi, Theo. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, so I'm a critic and I'm a writer um, and I focus on technology and art, um, specifically like the ideology of power behind seeing and algorithmic systems. And uh, my focus in the last couple of years has been on hidden technologies. So like how cameras and seeing are folded into machine learning and data and then how that system produces uh, a sense of reality. And Seeing, Naming, Knowing, which is a book that was published last year, really looks at Project Greenlight in Detroit and this kind of slow creep or introduction of constant surveillance in US cities through 24 seven cameras. So on how live feeds are trained on sidewalks, connected data centers in which there may or may not be someone watching. And the book kind of just looks at how that data is then combined with algorithmic systems that track and make sense of the world. Um, of who a person is, who they will be, uh, based on that very single moment of tagging the body in relation to space. So it's really, I'm most interested in the ethics of this seeing and how we can interpret the moment of capture. Thank you. Um, Theo, your, your latest film, Subject to Review, studies the instant replay technologies used in professional tennis, converging entertainment and justice. Would you mind just saying a few words um, to set up the film before we play the trailer? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, my film, Subject to Review, uh, on its surface is about um, this uh, instant replay system, Hawkeye, in, in tennis, which is a automated line calling system that was introduced in 2007. Um, that automatically makes decisions on whether a ball was in or out. Um, so on the surface, the, the film tracks the, the rise of, of this instant replay system and um, how it kind of really came to take the place of uh, human judgment in the sport of tennis. And I think uh, that's kind of on, on the surface and, and beyond it, the film is really about uh, 
these larger questions of how power kind of hides behind these uh, veils of objectivity or neutrality and, um, you know, how that applies for our conceptions of how justice works and, you know, algorithms and machine vision and all these things, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, later this later this talk. Great. Shall we, let's press play. Uh, that was beautiful. So subject to review is about tennis, but not really. Um, when you zoom out, uh, what are the larger questions that really arise from it? Uh, yeah, I think the, the larger questions, as I, as I started talking about earlier, is um, really uh, the ways in which power kind of always uh, serves up this front of um, objectivity or neutrality uh, as a way to kind of further justify their position of power. So just like Specifically with tennis, you have a private company, Hawkeye, who has introduced a, um, a, a vision system with uh, 10 cameras around a court that, uh, that, that are able to, you know, when compositing all of these images, um, determine whether ball is in or out. Um, and there's an interesting thing that happens in, in tennis specifically, where if, uh, if, if, if a player believes that the human judge on the court um, made a wrong call, they're able to appeal to Hawkeye. And now Hawkeye uh, has the final decision um, that actually can't be overruled by a human. So we have actually given all of the power and all of the agency to this automated system. Um, and it does that through um, presenting itself as this objective or neutral tool um, that you know is unassailable and unquestionable. And um, the film really just tries to peel back those layers and tries to like, rather than having you know the that kind of air of objectivity just really uh show that this is a process and that in the process there's always humans involved and it's possible for bias it's always possible to make mistakes and uh yeah the film really just really picks apart those those layers um most everything that we think of as artificial intelligence is also a kind of product of applying statistics and probability to a growing field of problems. So everything from predictive policing to online dating to surveillance assessment to targeted ads to voice detection and interpretation. Um, these machine eyes and algorithmic tools are really embedded with biases. Um, Nora, what kind of calls are people making for algorithmic justice or removing bias from the algorithms and visual tools? Sure. I mean, one thing that's really beautiful about subject to review is you, we get to see how the human actors kind of fade away to give way to the primacy of the virtual. So like the crowd is this multiplicity of sight lines, like thousands of eyes onto the court that fades like to Hawkeye, like to Empire, to this one eye that's all above us. So understanding how the eye sees and like defines reality and is used to produce evidence can be really a really powerful frame. And understanding how the eye has the power to show where a person is at what time um, also means that there's a power to strip context and narrative about why people were moving and what their intent was. Um, there are tons of activists and engineers and software developers along with like legal scholars who investigate what kind of just algorithms can be made. Um, and there's a few issues, like one is the concept that with like a more diverse data set and more material there, you can create a richer portrait of reality. And another is understanding that the algorithm, algorithm itself is not biased. It's who composes the data, what is human source, what data goes in or not. So 
the it, like with, in terms of intervention, you really need human intervention and automated systems, which the film shows. You know, people come in to measure, remeasure, analyze where the ball falls, analyze the measurements, and create truth like collaboratively um, in hybridity with the system. So. In that way, then measurement and seeing through the machine eye isn't the only metric of punishment of determining truth. It can become more collaborative between human and machine. Um, yeah, that's great. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Theo, you're you're soon to be released um, feature length um, documentary. All Light Everywhere is also about vision technology and power, and specifically the use of um, body cameras in policing. Um, another uh, kind of collaborative tool between companies and police departments and individuals um, to kind of uh, like, you know, create this, this all-knowing eye, you know, and neutralize what is certainly not neutral. Um, you've, we've talked in the past um, about how these two films, um, Sector to Review and All Light Everywhere are really kind of like in concert with each other. I mean, you, you actually made them um, you know, sort of in the t same time frame. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk about the relationship between the two and maybe also just briefly touch on how, you know, you've chose how your approach to um, um, documentary film making has changed as you became more interested in um, the eye of the camera and surveillance and things of these sorts. Yeah. Uh, so I think, um, a lot of my work right now, uh, as you said, is, is around uh, body, police body cameras um, since, uh, since 2015, since 2016, um, and this whole spat of, uh, of uh, incidents of police brutality uh, caught on camera. There's been a huge push to implement um, police uh, body camera programs across the country um, under the argument that, these, that if we are able to visualize, uh, to have a a sort of universal eye on what's happening on the ground that we will be able to hold police departments to account and also you know civilians to uh, prevent uh, false accusations. Um, I'm really interested in, in body cameras because they utilize a lot of the same language that we're talking about. Um, the way that they're literally sold in their, uh, in, in their uh, pamphlets um, is as these neutral observers that they just record the world as it is. Um, I think that if there's one thing that maybe I'm most obsessed with in my work is like that huge gap that exists between the world as it is and how it's recorded in a material format. Um, and I, I think uh, with body cameras, you have this really interesting thing where um, it's, it's sold to the public as a, uh, as a neutral witness to an event. But at the same time, in the title of the actual product, body camera, it tells you that it was shot from a body. So there you enter this paradox where it is both a seemingly objective view, but also a very subjective view. And I think that that is so interesting that you are then positing the body of the police officer as the neutral observer. And I think that that's a really problematic relationship to have with image making, because obviously a police officer is going into a situation with a very you know, specific set of assumptions. And they're there because there's, you know, a presumably a criminal act taking place. And so how does that create a criminal subject out of the person being observed? Um, I think that this maps onto a lot of my feelings about uh, the way that I, I make films as well. It's also this seeming paradox with, with documentary film, this, this struggle to, um, to tell a story that is maybe not about yourself, but at the same time is told by yourself as a filmmaker. Um, I think that you see a lot of uh, erasure in 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 uh, documentary history of like the documentarian themselves. So if you look at uh, the ethnographic films of uh, you know the early 20th century of of presenting the world as an other for the presumed you know Western audience um, that often went hand in hand with these colonial projects. I think you see that in a lot of the filmmaking we see today, where you have these talking head experts that are you know never really question who they are, where they're coming from, why they're making the film, who's giving them their funding, what are the outlets that these film images are gonna, gonna rest, what, what are the contexts that these images are gonna rest in? Um, so I really see that, that, that link between um, an objective you know, claim and a very subjective uh, knowledge making practice as, like, as, as a really interesting uh, space to navigate. 
Um, so I just want to, I want to talk a little bit more about storytelling, um, especially in relation to like surveillance creep. Um, the sci-fi future of like Steven Spielberg's Minority Report is becoming a reality as you just described um, this predictive policing and biometric technologies and facial recognition um, and other, you know, once unrealistic tools of surveillance are now um, fully mainstream. And even the dystopian representations we have seen of them seem perhaps even to be too optimistic. Um, I wanna ask you if, if you believe that's the case and, um, and also just uh, to kind of ground this in uh, our very present moment. You know, just last week, um, it was reported that the US government is currently in discussions with Facebook, Google, and several other tech companies about the possibility of using location and movement data from Americans' smartphones to combat the coronavirus. Um, how, does, how does surveillance creep into our everyday lives? Um, and how is the retelling of these like kind of outdated surveillance narratives really limiting our understanding of the, the reality of it and our imagination of a world beyond it? Nora? Yeah, I've been thinking about this line at the close of Theo's film. Um, it goes, progress continues this campaign against imperfection. And when I think about intervening, I think about slowing the seeing down and recognizing it as we've been talking about as entirely human constructed up to like the moment of release of decision making to the system. So, I mean, it's really hard for us to imagine technologies that come out of Silicon Valley is not extractive, especially when you put it in a history of how cameras have been built and how seeing is, um, you know, the violence of seeing with the first camera being a gun. Um, when the camera's ethic is like based in like lifting, recording, placing and freezing. So part of narrative and part of storytelling or the better story is precisely this slowing down, replaying, seeing who is seeing, seeing the judge, seeing the, emp the umpire above the court. Um, there's this moment when uh, Federer and Serena both approach the chair to debate what has been seen and challenge the person who's like defining the system, which I think is like one moment of intervention, like that in intervening in that like seamless production of truth. And also in data science, there's an argument for like a noisier creation of truth. Like there's more um, rhetorical debate. There's more rhetorical imagination around people defining the metrics of truth, people debating, interpreting uh, the, the material that the system's producing. So if we're in a predominantly visual regime and visual culture, it might be that the seeing of the crowd and the presentation of the data for many to argue over what is seen um, can make that a more collective act, make it non-extractive. Yeah, just to add on to that, I think that something that you see across all these conversations that we've had so far is that is there's this um, there's this argument, right, that with with more eyes or more different ways of seeing, we're going to have this transparent access to the truth, as if it like lies just on the other side, and you know all we need is a clear window, and you have whatever company of the day offering the clearest window onto that truth and saying that this is the only window onto the truth, um, and I think that trans the the argument goes that if if we can see it better we can better hold people to account for, for injustice and wrongdoing. Um, however, that's not always the case. That transparency can be just as much of a shield as anything else. That transparency, you know, without legibility doesn't really mean anything. So I think that some of the most, this goes back to the question you were saying before, I think that some of the most re effective resistance strategies that I've seen to this kind of all seeing eye is um, uh, a call for, for legibility in these systems around us. And I think that's the real issue that I have with Hawkeye is that not only is there not any uh, legibility, but there's no systems of appeal to challenge that authority. I'm, I'm totally okay with having a fairer system. I think that we so often just leave it at that uh, and we don't actually have the conversations about how we're going to have a more um, just system because it's in a, a very specific market interest to keep that power consolidated and to, to further hide, you know, them, to, to further like uh, cloak themselves behind the curtain as, you know, like the wizard of Oz. And um, if you kind of pull aside the curtain, you're, you're threatening their, their, their market standing. Um, I wanted to just, um, I wanted to just ask if, if this made any sense to you 
<laughs> uh, would you say technology is the co-author of our perception and our shared realities? Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I, it makes perfect sense. I think we could understand our seeing today as like fully mediated by smartphones, by these algorithmic, al algorithmic systems. It's really hard phrase to say. <laughs> <I'm nervous. laughs> um, but systems that de determine whether you should be hired for a job, whether you should get a loan, um, how, how our seeing is mediated feeds into technology that cements systems of power that are already in place. They're systems that we know very well. Um, and you know, back to the, like, the first question in terms of like predictive policing, the reason this neutrality or, or feigning neutrality is so dangerous is the eye, this eye is looking at areas where a prediction of criminality is already assumed. So the data produced in a, means that a person just standing in a high area of crime then becomes his own evidence of crime. So mm. our access to that eye is erased and removed. And we were talking earlier um, before the panel about how these tools express a desire for power, for knowing perfect moment in order to determine who we are in the future. So understanding how these moments are mediated and how meaning is constructed to be just one truth um, is, is really critical. I think more the more we understand the mediation that's taking place and how that truth's constructed, um, the better we can have a chance at creating more diverse realities, I guess. And yeah, I think with, I, with, go ahead, Thea. I was just gonna say, I think that the only thing I would have to add to that is that I think that um, like even more than co-author, I just would like, like the end to any argument, it would whatsoever that like tools are neutral things. And I yeah. can see that's, that's, the, that's the prevailing argument you see in Silicon Valley and in governments and militaries, like that, that these things are the natural state of the world. And if, if there's one thing, like if there's one conversation we can just cancel forever and just like never, <laughs> I mean, it maybe it's, maybe it's important to have the conversation, but like, let's just move on. We're like not in you know, middle school anymore. Like yeah. tools, are not, tools are not neutral things. And you know, as, as Nora said, you know, they're, they're an expression of a desire. They're an expression of a, a desired outcome. And we need to start talking about them as um, you know, the, meaning, the meanings and the outcomes are already encoded within the tool itself. You know, yeah. a hammer, a hammer was designed for a very specific thing, you know, and yeah. we just have to start, you know, thinking a little bit deeper about, you know, what those things are. I mean, maybe you could speak a little bit about, um, um, you know, the drone, you know, <laughs> as, as the kind of um, pinnacle of our like machine eye surveillance capitalism um, today, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but the interesting thing, I mean, Hita Shar writes about this and, you know, with a drone, a drone can zoom in to the ground. A drone can also look at like the faces on, on the ground. Um, we have like that capacity within the surveillance uh, tools that we do use. But the fact that the drone maintains the God mm -hmm. side view, the, that it maintains this above, um, above the world kind of engineering perspective is, is issue like why it doesn't zoom in why it doesn't look at the people on the ground um so looking for a more lateral kind of ability to like toggle between perspectives i think is something that can be easily built in to the seeing tools that we have and in terms of like um i mean both of your films i think do an incredible job of like tracking like going back and making it really um evident to the audience that None of these things, you know, this none of this was built like built yesterday. You know, these are these are layers and layers of um, of history and people and decision making and policies and um, engineering, all kind of serving the same um, the same yeah like system, you know, if you will. And I think that's why I'm so drawn to them because they, you know. Um, they are telling, uh, it's not just a dystopic view of, you know, technology, it's telling us, you know, the story of how we got where we are. So you can kill that conversation about tools are neutral, like mm -hmm. once and for all. And it's really kind of, you know, it's, it's allowing the audience to come come to their that conclusion on their own, actually, which is obviously a much um, more, uh, you know, a, a strong, like a much stronger than them than you telling them you know, straight up, 
right? They can yeah. see that. For yeah, themselves. I think I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big like advocate of just like looking backwards to kind of understand the conversation that we're having right now and where it might go. And the thing that I'm constantly, you know, uh, amazed and humbled by is like how these conversations right now about what a camera is and what it can and can't do were being had 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about a criminal subject, uh, there's, you know, there's letters to the editor from 1860 that can do a better job of answering questions than the New York Times, like, you know, editorial <laughs> board. I, I, there's, there's a story that I think is like really amazing about, I mean, maybe this is off track, but I, I love this, uh, is that in the 1860s in France, they were talking about um, maybe starting to, to, to photograph criminals uh as uh, as a way of like documenting them and you know just knowing like who was a criminal and who wasn't um and there was this letter to the editor that um was so it was, it was being considered and there was a letter to this like um uh police uh journal and they said that uh photographing a criminal uh was an additional crime beyond the sentence uh that was handed down so this idea of it, of, of you being fixed in time and place as a criminal, as a separate act from, you know, serving time in jail. Like those are so hand in hand now, like it's, you know, you get arrested, you get your mug shot, you go to jail, like that's all, you know, that's the workflow, mm -hmm. right? But this idea that we're having a conversation in the 1860s about like, maybe I'm not a criminal forever. Maybe like my own identity and my own being is a lot more fluid. I can be a criminal now, but I can be reformed later. And so how do our technologies actually, you know, in a minority report way like how do you actually create the image before the image is even taken you have to look at the apparatus you have to look at the position of the person taking the image you have to look at you know the distribution context all of these things are conversations that have been had and i think that you know i we have such amnesia like you know it's, i don't can't even you know every like week i don't even remember what yeah it's just uh and i yeah i think that that's also like a market interest to keep the the, the cultural memory refreshed and flushed out so you can you know build it all up again and um, yeah, I think, uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think you really, you hit the nail on the head though, you know, um, uh, with that, um, Nora, do you want to add anything? Because we're coming to the end here. Sure. I, I, I mean, just following up on with yeah, that's an amazing letter. I need to, I need to say uh, yeah, that, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it just brings one back around to, you know, systems freezing us in time like this, which which prevents the ability to understand the human subject as a, as something that changes, that's mutable, that's fluid. Um, so my actions yesterday don't reflect like some fixed mark of character about who I am, that I can change over time, I can improve, I can, or one can improve. So it's, it's uh, making space for this mutability within systems, um, having, an eye that sees you, but then also like looks again or is programmed to like look again and reevaluate to open the system up to to change and revision, which is something we do normally with each other and how we assess each other as human beings, I would hope. Or, you know, we can write people up immediately. But, you know, I, I think resisting that, that freezing, that uh, idea of a, a person's actions defining who they are needs to be more fluid just as we enact it in life and our systems can actually reflect that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, well, maybe I'll just, I'll just end on this quote from Ursula Franklin that I love. Um, she says, not all problems can be illuminated, but all problems can be, no, I'm sorry, back it up. Not all problems can be solved, but all problems can be illuminated. If the eggs are scrambled, they're scrambled. You can't unscramble them. All you can do is cook them and share them with somebody. So that's that's <laughs> Ursula Franklin, and that's um, a, a COVID nineteen uh, <laughs> moment. I want to thank you guys for uh, being here with with us today um, for making this extra effort. I want to thank um, CPH Docs uh, um, for for all of their hard work and being able to pull this off so last minute um, under the circumstances. Uh, I want to also mention that um, Theo Anthony is actually also in the uh, exhibition um, that was postponed um, at Kunsthal Charlottenburg, but will be up soon, um, hopefully in April. 
um, as well as with Simon Debra Muller. Um, he will also be in it, and um, Simon um, um, Simon Denny in our sister show, which is at Trannon. Um, so all in due time. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, um, Thank you so much. Laura and you, all the other guests. Uh, I think we're just gonna sign off now. Yeah, it's so quick. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could keep going. We can we can yeah. come back on yeah, another we'll Zoom later. <laughs> we'll move it to the DMs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. all right. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Bye.